Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Diana. I graduated from SLM in 2017, and it's nice to be back. Almost feels like back in a classroom. But anyway, it's been two years. I've been in the blockchain space ever since through the regulatory technology space, which brought me into the ICO hype, which we're probably going to talk about. And I've been collaborating with a bunch of different blockchain projects along the lines of really thinking through what business models work and what business models don't work in light of regulatory issues. I'm super excited about this event today because I think it's going to be a good discussion to gain perspective on what makes sense and what doesn't in light of all the hype that we've seen. We've seen a lot of volatility. We've seen a lot of suspicion on the blockchain uh, side of things. And we brought speakers with different perspectives that are really going to challenge and build each other's thinking and your thinking. And questions from you are super welcome. And it's going to be a great discussion. In terms of the agenda, we're going to start with a blockchain overview with Kelly Lavallee Hunt, followed by a conversation on the tension between regulators and innovators. Then we're going to talk about business models that work and business models that don't work. And then we're going to talk about regulatory issues and end with a global perspective. So Kelly Lavallee Hunt, I'm going to introduce her really quickly. She has a wealth of different experiences in the space from having 20 years of experience in the data center space, software development, and telecommunications industry, after which she joined the blockchain world at very, very early stages. And she's received a number of different awards, which you can see in her bio in terms of being a pioneer, pioneer in blockchain and cryptocurrency from Forbes Magazine, uh, Innovation Leadership Award uh, from Microsoft, and she is a rock star, so come on up. <laughs> Wow, thank you very much. What a warm welcome. Thank you, Yale of Management, Yale School of Management, and thank you very much, uh, Diana, for having me. So I can hear a little bit of an echo, but I guess if I step back, then I won't hear that um, as much. Just a show of hands, how many people in here own cryptocurrency? Awesome, how many, has, that's changed uh, since I started speaking about this. How many people have run uh, blockchain projects? Awesome. I like it when the, the people that have a lot of experience in blockchain projects uh, raise their hand to that question. They don't lift their head up. It's like a, it's like, <laughs> it's like um, uh, something like, oh, this is not worth my time to even lift my head up, but um, I'll lift my hand up. I love it. I do that too. Um, <laughs> so a little bit about myself. My background is in data centers and software. I've worked everywhere from uh, United States, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, China, um, Africa, uh, a couple of countries in Africa, not to name the continent, um, but in Nigeria, uh, the UK, Germany, Spain, across all of Europe, Middle East, Africa, and many different countries. So I have a varied background in technology, from data centers to software to coding, um, blockchain, cryptocurrency. I became very interested in cryptocurrency in 2014. There's going to be a test afterwards. Um, <laughs> and um, Forbes found out about it. They put me in their magazine as a pioneer in blockchain and cryptocurrency, which was slightly embarrassing because the people before me who have already treaded the path um, gave me a little bit of shtick about that. Um, but it was kind of them to do that, so don't take it that seriously. There are people before me that are much more clever and interesting to find out about, and I'm going to mention them in my presentation. So as we begin, and how do I switch that over to my... Can you guys see my, I, I hit the button, but it didn't go through. Excellent. If you guys want to check me out on Twitter, that's my Twitter uh, name. So this is what I'm going to go through very, very quickly. Since you guys know a lot about blockchain, um, what Diana and I spoke about is leveling the playing field for today and starting out with an understanding of what is blockchain. And at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about what I think about cryptocurrencies, although I don't have a Series 65, so I'm not recommending any of the cri cryptocurrencies or any type of investment strategy. Um, but I did want to at least mention that because a lot of people do ask me about that. So. 
Um, this is, I'm gonna go through what a basic centralized ledger is, just so we all understand that. And I'm gonna go through it really quickly because all of you are in business school or have gone through business school or have a great understanding of how business finance works and blockchain at this point. So this is a centralized um, authority. This could be a bank, this could be a government, this could be an Excel spreadsheet with one procurement person in the entire company that's holding that ledger. So you have this, this person, this participant, um, they go to the um, centralized authority for uh, validation. Uh, the last time I was here a couple of years ago at Yale uh, Business School, um, or School of Management, they, I, I said it's kind of like a keg. You know, you go to the keg and you get the beer and then you go and you're carrying around your glasses of beer. And they kind of understood that. And this was, I think, two years ago. And they really got into it and they asked me a lot of questions about cryptocurrency and how they can get involved in blockchain, et cetera. So, um, but it was, it was really at that point where I compared the centralized authority to the keg. Uh, that they really got it. So there's a trust there. You go to the keg, you know it's gonna be there, right? You know the beer's gonna be there. Um, the authority, the, the bank, the government, you trust it. They build these beautiful big buildings down in Wall Street um, in the financial district, these amazing banks, and, and they build them so you have comfort there. You trust it, you, you, you hold it as an authority. And these amazing marble uh, fronts and vaults Many people go there, they deposit whatever information, asset, currency, and you trust it. In a decentralized environment, how it's changed, and this is a blockchain network, this is a person, this is a node, these are people, nodes, all communicating within the network, within the blockchain. All the data is exchanged, and those of you that have built blockchain uh, networks and protocols and solutions, you guys right now are going nodes. You're not telling about the nodes. I will tell about the nodes. So what happens as the blockchain goes through its process? Communicating with all the nodes. So the way I explained this a couple of years ago is that everybody with a beer glass is a node. When one beer glass breaks, nothing really happens in the blockchain. In a single authority, when something breaks, when the keg breaks, there's no more distribution. Everything stops. There's no more communication. There's no more authority. There's no more trust. Then what happens? There's no more data. In the blockchain, sorry, in the blockchain, when no, one node sinks, one node breaks, it goes down. Continued communication. When the node comes back up again, it automatically sinks. This is a change in source, from single source to multi-source. So if you take a transaction, let me swig some water here. Everybody following? Thumbs up. Just pretend like you're Facebook, let's go. Um, you have a transaction, this is in a blockchain network. You have exchanges, transactions, updates, update of information, update of that Excel spreadsheet. Now, first of all, let me say, I am a, a big firm believer in public blockchains, mainnet blockchains, private blockchains, and hybrids. In the beginning, the purists were like, nope, it all has to be mainnet, it all has to be always has to be uh, a public blockchain. But I believe in decentralizing um, Excel spreadsheets. I, de I believe in decentralizing a procurement process. I believe in consortiums. I believe in utilizing this technology the best way you know how. So let's go to the nodes. Mining nodes, there's four different types of nodes within the blockchain. There are different functions of the nodes. These are the different types and these are the different functions. I have labeled them as um, something that we can all understand quickly. The mining nodes are the worker bees. They build the blocks. The full nodes carries the copies throughout all the network to each of the nodes to make sure that the process is validated. 
And it can validate, the full node can validate all the way back to the, uh, the Genesis block. Everybody knows what a Genesis block is, right? I love that name. <laughs> um, so that kind of is the law. The super nodes, um, they're always on, they're always operating, they're always propagating nodes um, throughout the network. They're like the messengers. They go around and they're charismatic about what they do and what they're carrying, their information to all the nodes. And then the light nodes or the thin nodes, they actually just have a little piece of paper go and going around and they're checking everything that is validated and everything is proper, but it doesn't have all the information on that node. And that's, that's, that's very good for um, speeding up a process with a, a transaction or an information share. So let's go back to updating the ledger. So if you are having transactions across the nodes and all these um, four types of nodes are running around doing what they're supposed to be doing. You will have transaction after transaction after transaction that will get you to a block. Each block together goes through a, a, a validation process, a, a block mining process, a validation process, and a consensus process. As it goes through, and I'm, I'm speeding through because I have limited amount of time, but also I think that you guys are getting the idea of what the blockchain actually is. The consensus, the validation, the mathematics, the mining comes to a point where a block is made. Let's talk about um, contracts, tra contracts and trans uh, transactions. In Ethereum, you can actually hold data or hold representation of the data on the blockchain. And that's a very good point because a lot of um, many blockchains in the beginning weren't able to do that. So it's very important that we recognize when you have smart contracts, then you have the ability to transact with information. You're, are you in the right room? <laughs> awesome. That's okay. Come on in. The water's fine. Um, <laughs> I would love that. Um, so you can use contracts to, if I, if I have a, a, a piece of music that I want to validate on the blockchain, I want to make sure that everyone knows that that is my music. And in 20 years or 40 years, then I can actually make a smart contract now that says every time somebody uses a piece of my music, every time somebody uses my lyrics, my foundation gets paid for that in cryptocurrency. That's a way to use smart contracts with media or with um, music. Assets, um, validation of uh, real estate, um, transferring of um, assets throughout your family, um, you know, their communication, um, research. When you're able to do research, think about it like this. If Tesla was able to have his research put on the blockchain, his family would be still receiving uh, funds on, with cryptography and with cryptocurrency uh, from his uh, blockchain validation from, from his, for his research that he's, he had done. So these are, these are just a number of ways that this, the smart contracts are gonna be utilized in the future 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now. It, they might evolve a little bit, but that's going to be the, the way of the future. It's going to change the way we do business. It's gonna change the way we live. It's gonna change what is valid, what is an asset. Not only a currency or a fiat currency is going to be an asset. Our lyrics, our music, So if you take a um, look at some of these use cases, and we can go into that in later, deta um, later detail. I have three minutes left to quickly go through this. But these are some of the use cases that have already been built. So I'm the first person to sign a contract with a blockchain company, uh, with Microsoft, with AWS, Google, Red Hat, and a few other UN. Um, and one of the things that they asked me first was, can you actually build something with blockchain now? Is it actually being built? 
So when, when we went to them and actually showed them what we had built, they were shocked. I think that's one of the reasons why Forbes decided to put me in their magazine, but other than that, don't know why. <laughs> so interesting cryptocurrencies, and notice I put interesting cryptocurrencies, not invest in cryptocurrency. Um, these are the ones that I, I really like. Zcash, Amber Valdat is on the board of. Um, Joe Lubin co-wrote the Ethereum code, so ETH. Um, DAI is very interesting. It's like a stable coin. It is, from a abstract point of view, it is the Federal Reserve of the cryptocurrency. <laughs> Um, they, these are the projects also. Coinbase I always think is great because that's a first starter and you guys are way ahead of that. Um, Portis is a wallet and infrastructure, um, uh, blockchain infrastructure. DAOs are very interesting to get involved in. Um, Gitcoin is an amazing project. You guys should look up Gitcoin. Kevin is doing amazing things there. Um, Ethereum.org and Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, they have over 700 organizations, maybe even more than that now, that are taking part in the alliance. And this is the reading list, and this is, I have two minutes to just quickly go through this. The very top, the GitHub reading list, please, if you do nothing else with this presentation, please take a picture of this slide, because this information will take you into the future of blockchain. You can learn about Merkle trees. You can learn about sharding. You can learn about the legal and regulations. It's an amazing reading list. Um, I wish it was owned by me, but it's a decentralized reading list. Um, everybody adds to it. Um, I don't, I, I, I haven't um, added much to it. I, I am happy that more clever people than I do add to it. Um, but if you, whatever you want to find out about it, uh, about blockchain and cryptocurrencies. There is a plethora of information. You can go down that rabbit hole for days, weeks, months. Andreas Antonopoulos is a personal friend of mine. Um, he's written some amazing books. Um, follow him on Twitter, his Twitter uh, name is there. Mastering Bitcoin, great, fantastic book. Uh, Mastering Ethereum, The Internet of Money. Joe Lubin, um, he is one of my mentors. I've been uh, meeting with him and talking to him over the past five years. I have zero seconds left, uh, <laughs> very quickly. Uh, he co-wrote the Ethereum code with Vitalik Buterin, and he is, well, he's a wealth of information. He's very into Web3, he's very much into different types of protocols um, and also Ethereum, and he started the company Consensus. William Moger wrote a book. Um, he also has a conference around um, in May can't remember off the top of my head what the name of the conference is, but a fantastic conference for learning about the financial application of blockchain um, and the blockchain of finance. Amber Valdet, she's amazing. She built Quorum. She used to work for JP Morgan. You should follow her. She's wicked smart. Um, and Patrick is my cyber guy. Anything I need to know about cybersecurity, um, cryptography, he is in the know. He has some amazing, amazing stuff to read on his website. Um, and um, just the name of, of the information there, Gambling with Secrets, I think that's, it's, um, it's very interesting to read his stuff. But thank you very much for having me. Please reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, I answer questions quite often. Somebody sent me a message about five minutes before I, I spoke and said, how do I get information about what you're working on? Um, and I sent him the reading list back and I said, after you go through this reading list, let's have a conversation. So please feel free to reach out to me and thank you very much for you guys' um, attention and thank you very much, Diana, for your invitation. David Weald here with us. He is the chairman and CEO of Weald & Company. He is revolutionizing investment banking by harnessing the power of the cloud. He's also a former vice chairman of the NASDAQ, where he worked with people like Steve Jobs, Tom St Stenberg, the, the founder of Staples, and he's priced overall over 1,000 public equity offerings. 
And most of all, most recently, he's known as the father of the Jobs Act, which if you don't know, you should look it up. It laid the foundation of crowdfunding platforms and new sources of fun, new ways of fundraising by harnessing the power of getting sources of, of um, wealth across distributed platforms. And he is another awesome rock star, and he's going to give us our initial keynote. So, come on up. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, first of all, no stupid questions. In fact, the only ones that are stupid are the ones that you don't ask. Um, I, you know, I engage in quite a bit of jargon uh, sometimes, and if you want to put the brakes on me, feel free to. Um, uh, this is a little bit of a different uh, slide on it or, or, or slant. We're going to talk about you know, some of this tension that goes on between regulators and innovators. But I also, just one of the things about the JOBS Act, it's what gives birth to securities crowdfunding. If you just saw SEC Chairman Jay Clayton's uh, uh, pronouncement that they were going to allow testing the waters to be done by all public offerings after the pop and drop and sort of dysfunction that's happened with WeWorks and Uber and some of the big companies that have gone public. Uh, that's, that was a concept that came out of the JOBS Act under, uh, uh, under particularly Title I of the JOBS Act that gave birth to something called emerging growth company IPOs. Um, uh, Diana mentioned that I'd actually, you know, I, t I actually priced about uh, 500 IPOs. It's something that you can't do today because we don't have the volume of IPOs going on. But a couple of them that have grown up or uh, Celgene. I worked on Celgene when it was about a $100 million market value company. It's in the uh, process of being sold at $70 billion right now. Uh, we have uh, Jensen Wang's company, NVIDIA, I worked on, which did uh, uh, 3D chips, which for all the gaming, but also uh, now it's moved into artificial intelligence uh, applications and things. And so there's a real broad range. I am a, uh, what I would call a capital markets uh, uh, zealot, for want of a better description, or evangelist, because I think that access to capital is what drives innovation. And innovation, in turn, is what reinvents or disrupts economies. And if you don't stay on the bleeding edge as an economy, then you are, uh, you are basically all but certain to effectively lag your competitors, your tax rolls will drop, the quality of employment will drop over time because this is a big, very competitive world that we're in. Let me see if I can navigate a little bit. So this is just quickly, I mean, more, our firm is a decentralized investment bank where we've just flipped the model on its head. It's a low fixed cost, high payout uh, model. We're in 17 states now in the District of Columbia. We're registered in 38 states. We started the business in August of 2016. But the basic thesis is that you can, should be able to work anywhere, office anywhere today. And uh, it's also because we're not paying people salaries on the front end. It's one of those things for folks that have left the industry to become a chief financial officer want to come back in. We can relicense folks, but also it's really important for women that have left the workforce for six or seven years, and they're now working in a suburb, and, they're, and their option, their only sort of viable option is to become a residential real estate broker if they want to be home at 3 o'clock to meet with their kids. And so this, we think, will start to provide a different kind of work-life balance for folks that are trained, were trained on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs and potentially want to come back in and use their skill set to do mergers and acquisitions, private placements, and similar types of transactions. So, you know, if you're a licensed professional uh, and you, you are, are FINRA licensed, I'm just going to, we, we're sort of uh, jumping the gun here. I wasn't prepared to do it, but since I'm at a business school, if you happen to be FINRA licensed, your licenses expire in two years, okay? If you want to connect in and support people doing transactions, and maintain your licenses, you can track me down, okay? It's an option we offer to people. Um, so, um, you know, we went through a, kind of an expose on what, what, what we're talking about, but a couple of things uh, about this industry. You can tokenize anything, right? That little license for your software that, you know, is a, a, a long string of digits, it's a token. It doesn't trade, but it's a token. Okay, and uh, these things have been around for a long time. There, there could be a software layer, which is what, where all the kind of the, the goodies are, whether it's smart contracts, then ultimately blocking into the, the block. And this is sort of just a hierarchically how you kind of, I look at, at, at this business, right? Uh, it can be applied to all sorts of things, but I think that what's really interesting now is, 
is uh, you know, the ability to disintermediate the intermediators. What do I mean by that? Intermediaries are folks you know, like banks. And so if you start thinking about, you know, about getting around the banks to do transactions and transfer money, it's a very scary thing. I actually, my father, who is a Yale undergrad and Yale law graduate, you know, asked me what, I, what did I think about Maxine Waters you know, putting the brakes on Libra and, and, uh, and Facebook. And I said, I thought personally it was really important because you got to number one, make sure if you're putting a stable coin and it's backed by underlying basket of currencies and they've got 2.4 billion uh, users, if you will, in the marketplace or monthly users, I think that's a Wikipedia statistic, that you've got to worry about, are you all of a sudden going to displace the dollar with other currencies? And also, who's going to mine the store? Jurisdictionally, they went over to, to uh, Switzerland. And so, you know, you look at the potential for that on a scale like you've never seen before to effectively create a currency that is potentially going to displace the value of the dollar as a benchmark currency, you damn well better be paying attention. That's my message to Congress. <clears throat> Now, what's my experience with regulators and innovators? I've known every SEC chair going back to Arthur Levitt. That includes Harvey Pitt, Chris Cox, Mary Shapiro, uh, Mary Jo White, and most recently I was down in Jay Clayton's office with, uh, uh, with uh, John Ashcroft, who was the former general counsel, uh, uh, attorney general of the United States. Spoken at the SEC a broad number of times, testified in Congress, particularly in front of the House Financial Services Committee, Subcommittee on Capital Markets, then to the White House, uh, worked, uh, was at the uh, Obama administration's I Have a Dream Summit, uh, worked with the U.S. Office of Science and Technology Policy about some of these things. And they are actually, if you think about the Jobs Act, they were one of the reasons why the Jobs Act got put into law, because there was a fellow in the room that was a senior policy advisor, actually a Yale, named Doug, uh, Doug Rand. And, uh, and he put a bug in the ear of the president. The president put pressure on the Senate to get what was a uh, House drafted bill uh, uh, passed into law. A little bit of the, the history there. But the reason is, is that if you're really not getting capital into entrepreneurs' hands, you don't have a good long-term outlook as a nation, in my humble opinion. So for, from our perspective, you know, we've, I've done a lot of innovation, uh, uh, allocation matrix program, allocation uh, algorithmic allocation programs for uh, uh, a new issue distribution. This is the first back in the 90s. I uh, was a pioneer in the use of Form S3 shelf registrations to do overnight equity offerings and subvert the kind of the uh, pernicious intent of, of uh, short sellers hedge funds. There was a time in this country when most institutional investors were long only, mostly mutual funds. And then in the 90s, there was a sudden rise in hedge funds that could short securities. And they have an interest when you're out marketing a transaction to bang the stock price down lower. And that obviously is not in the interest of the current shareholders, legacy shareholders, or the management team. And it increases your cost of capital. So there were a series of innovations around uh, registered directs, if there any of you have any uh, investment banking expertise that actually improved uh, um, the cost of capital for companies. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, Diana mentioned, I won't belabor the point, but a lot of these folks that uh, I had the, the sincere honor and privilege to interact, I used to joke that I was the complaint department for Steve Jobs. He called me once a month, uh, threatened to take his listing over to the New York Stock Exchange. And, um, and then uh, one time, because uh, he found out that we were standardized on Dell computers, and when I pointed out that he wasn't integrated, he did not integrate the Mac with the BlackBerry. Then he spent uh, a number of uh, a number of months uh, interrogating me about how the BlackBerry was being used. This was prior to the launch of the iPhone. So hindsight being 2020, I now know what he was up to. Okay, um, we interact with a lot of uh, lawyers and entrepreneurs, and ultimately wrestling with uh, people that are wrestling with uh, innovation and uh, and regulation. Um, just some of my uh, some of the things that I'm involved with Galaxy or 55.com, backed by a very uh, impressive Chinese billionaire, uh, Mao Dong Zhu, and I uh, was just down doing a strategy session on at their offices at 199 Water, and uh, and they literally in the last two months I think have doubled the number of people that are working there. Um, basically, the idea is to create a, a global best bid and offer by acquiring and integrating uh, many, many, many different exchanges across the globe. INX, 
which has got an F1. That's a that's a uh, it's an Israeli backed company. Uh, it is uh, chartered in uh, Gibraltar, which is one of the leaders in uh, sort of blockchain uh, law and regulation. And um, and INX uh, uh, is uh, it's actually a very interesting statement. I would you know I would encourage you to go look at it. But they are trying to create exchanges in everything from uh, tokens of securities to uh, to. Uh, um, uh, derivatives uh, to currencies, and um, and the SEC has been for 20 months going back and forth with them, and so the kind of the template they're very they're very much aware that they're going to create a precedent. They're also going to issue a token as a security to finance themselves, so it's sort of a uh, treasure trove of uh, of what the regulators are establishing as precedent for people that are looking to raise capital in a publicly registered. Offering of which there's been very few to date. Uh, Core Connects, which is in private markets, and then Templum, which is an alternative trading system that was the first appro approved by the Securities and Exchange Commission to do uh, uh, private market uh, trans secondary transactions. Um, you know, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, um, uh, well, if we just recently went through an SEC audit. We own a broker dealer. And it's kind of interesting. They picked up, they took every file we had on everything that we were involved with in the, uh, in, that was related to crypto and blockchain. Our deals, our outside business activities, and I will, I'm proud to say that we got very light comments in general. We got zero comments or criticisms on what we were doing in the blockchain space. So, uh, <clears throat> benefits uh, that I think are really important versus, I think, the mumbo-jumbo mythological non-benefits, which is that it's going to reduce transaction costs. It's a benefit, right? So if I want to do cross-border you know, uh, currency uh, uh, transfers using a stable coin, it, the theory is, is that it should cost people like a, Mexi uh, uh, a Mexican immigrant who's put, sending money back to their, uh, to their home, they're going to get gouged a hell of a lot less than they've been gouged in the past. I mean, in theory, we should be dramatic. All it is bits and bytes going across uh, the internet. And so as a consequence, we, we should expect to see some real value created there. Uh, there's also uh, real significance to the importance of the frequency of distribution. And by, by that, I mean that if you did a closed-end bond fund or a real estate investment trust, you would find that the market values higher frequency of dividend payments, okay? So that a 12, uh, so that a monthly dividend structure is going to typically trade at about a 4% premium to a quarterly pay structure. Why? Because retail purchases those securities, and they live uh, on, a, on, a, on a weekly, monthly, not quarterly basis, okay? So, those, so if you can all of a sudden very efficiently pay distributions at a greater frequency, the thesis should be that you're going to trade at an even higher premium to net asset value, or you're going to actually have an advantage over those funds, those real estate investments that are paying less frequently. Does that make sense to everybody? OK. I mean, there, this notion that there is some sort of supernatural automatic liquidity with securities that are tokenized is complete Hogwash and academic will talk about, uh, and we hear this all the time at conferences. You know, there there are network effect securities which are uh, large capitalization, where lots of people, buyers and sellers. This is how Intel trades, Exxon Mobil, and uh, thousands and thousands of people looking at a security at any point in time. Okay, but then the vast majority of companies that need support, right? They're what academics call asymmetrical order book securities, big seller, no buyer, OK? You need a liquidity uh, intermediary, somebody to go out and tell the story when you got a half a million shares to go in a stock that trades 10,000 shares a day, OK? How is that going to happen? And if you leak that information to the market, then people are going, you're going to have adverse consequences. People are going to short the security and so on and so forth. So just the fact that you, that you tokenize something or put it on the block or you know put a smart contract in there is not automatically going to instantaneously give you liquidity okay and that's an important thing to understand securities that trade better right 
include things with a yield. Why? Because people buy them up because they see the yield gets out of hand. So real estate assets are going to trade a little bit better uh, that, and, and, and debt funds and so on and so forth. But if you take a common, a, a small company that's pre-revenue, medical device or a biotechnology company, and you tokenize it, I can guarantee you that it's not going to trade a hell of a, probably even worse than it trades currently because right now the whole world doesn't have access to cyber wallets, right? The adoption, if you will, in the marketplace, everybody has a securities account, right, or a self-directed account. They can buy a stock, but until you can get tokens into the regular system so that all the investors can actually access it, you're actually minimizing your total breadth of distributions. One of the things that I've said to the folks at Securitize, I think I saw one of them on the, maybe on the speak, maybe not, yes, but uh, you know that the client, who is the issuer, wants to see wants to m maximize their ability to deal with any investor. So if the investor wants to own it as a traditional security or a token on the block, you should be able to, you should want to allow them to do both, right? Okay, don't tell the investor how they should interact with your company if you're out there raising capital. Now I'm just gonna run through a couple of things because I think it's important just to tell you you know, what, what happened in the United States from a capital formation standpoint. And uh, this is a chart that went up to the house. It's 2010. It was one of the first ones. And you see these small IPOs dropped off a cliff back in 1998. What happened in 1998? Reg ATS, alternative trading systems. We went to electronic stock markets. We had the internet, you know, collapse commissions. And so the ability for intermediaries to intermediate and make markets, to get compensated to do that disappeared. And the bottom dropped out of the small initial public offering. And it never recovered. And for a long time, people made a lot of fun out of me, saying I didn't know what I, it was a market cycle issue, and then all of a sudden, after three years of it not recovering, people all of a sudden said, hey, maybe this wheel guy isn't so dumb after all. <laughs> okay. So uh, here's a, a chart that went up in front of the uh, House Subcommittee on Capital Markets, and all we did was index to that same year when we saw the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the dawn of electronic stock markets and the collapse of the economic incentives in the aftermarket. And you can see what happened to the number of listed companies in the United States. And you can see where you know, China was going. As one of the, one of the uh, uh, congressmen said to me, Mr. Wheel, which one is, uh, is the United States? I said, sir, we're the one on the bottom. He said, Mr. Wheel, which one is China? Sir, they're the ones on the top. He said, Mr. Wheel, which one would you prefer to be? OK, now this is just a simple you know, take the trend, you know, plot it up and say, how many listed companies would we have in the United States had we not screwed around with our market structure versus what we actually have? And let me ask you a question. Do you think that that gulf there is opportunity cost? Or do you think it's all been replaced by private markets? Something worth thinking about. A lot of people would, you know, or apologists will say that there's a lot that's replaced in public markets uh, by private markets, but I don't think that there's really a lot of evidence of that. If actually I, I go through and I look at things like this, which is the startup uh, rates in the United States, this is U.S. Census Bureau data, and it's actually uh, from 2006 to 2017, and red is, the, is, a hot, is a double the, dark red is double the rate of startups of uh, the white area. And so, what happens is access to capital in, uh, in, in major swaths of the country has been compromised. Why? Because you can't get companies public, because you can't drive an exit sooner, okay? So anything that we can do here to facilitate access to capital is important. In the meantime, we've seen this massive uh, loss of uh, middle market investment banks, which are, are intermediaries that bring capital to these com companies. And I say, if you're not troubled by this, you should be troubled by it. So this is the stuff that we want to try and fix, because if we do, we're going to be a hell of a lot more competitive as a, a, as a country. So regulators versus <clears throat> innovators. So first of all, the SEC's mission is to protect investors to maintain orderly and efficient markets and to facilitate capital formation. I would say that to facilitate capital formation until we got going down in the House a number of years ago was the bastard stepchild of uh, the SEC's mission. It was, you know, it's, it's the third thing that they put 
and they tend to prioritize you know, in, uh, protecting investors. And I will tell you that their definition of an investor is somebody that's going to come into a stock, not somebody that only owns the stock, that already owns the stock. That's a problem because the people that the incumbent investors are the ones that got you there. That are the riskiest money. And so if there isn't, if there isn't parity there, if they aren't worried about protecting people that are already in these stocks, they should be, okay? So I'm just, hint, hint, if you get a chance to bend the, the ear of your Congress man or woman. Innovators are interested in talent, capital, and speed. And so regulation increases costs and decreases speed. Okay, make sense? Regulation increases costs and decreases speed. Is that 10 minutes? Yeah. Good, thank you. Yeah, I want to make sure it wasn't 10 seconds. <laughs> Innovators disrupt. Some look to disrupt regulation. And I would say that the whole Silicon Valley crowd largely doesn't work in regulated businesses. So I had one of the top 10 you know, name brand venture capitalists in this country ask me to chair the board of one of his companies. And they were going to, and he went around talking about disrupting regulation. And I was telling him, that's not gonna end well for you, okay, as an investment. But for me, as a fiduciary, it's gonna be even it's gonna end even worse because I will have liability. At least if you're just an owner of the stock, they're not gonna come and throw you in jail, okay? So I said, no, thank you. Make a long story short, that company went bankrupt. Uh, the rational person tends to rationalize their way to the conclusion that they want to reach. And if you look at some of this nonsense that went on where people were take, going after initial coin offerings, um, you know, there were some prominent attorneys that, that basically said these are not securities offerings. And look, anytime anybody's investing in something with an expectation that's going to increase in price, it's likely a securities offering. Okay, um, the, uh, so why is the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, so damn cautious? And okay, I'm gonna answer a little bit of a riddle that a lot of congressmen have asked me because the first time I went up on, on, on the Hill, you'd think that they'd know this, but a lot of them are, are first-term congressmen and they'll say that the SEC has broad exemptive authority, okay? So they can do a lot of stuff if they want to. Why don't they? Well, the answer is because Congress, if something blows up or doesn't go well in the press and people descend on them, Congress will haul their, their, the, the chairman up to the, up to the hill to testify, beat him about the ear or she with a, with a figurative two by four and threaten to cut their budget, okay? And so it doesn't work well. They become, and in fact, I was just uh, at a conference uh, last week, I think it was, with Hester Pierce, who's an SEC commissioner, the one that they call Crypto Mom, if you've seen that in the press. And, and uh, she was, she was uh, acknowledging the work that I'd done on the Jobs Act and basically telling people, look, if you really want to get something moving with the Securities and Exchange Commission, one of the ways that you do it is you get legislation that turns out to be heavily bipartisan, doesn't even need to get done many times, but it signals to the Securities and Exchange Commission that there's an appetite for uh, this. So if you go all the way back to decimalization, when they took the trading size from, uh, well, it used to be that, uh, that securities trading was, was uh, uh, denominated in fractions and they went down to a penny, and there was a bill that never made it out of the House called the Common Sense something something bill, C-E-N-T-S, that was sponsored by Mike Oxley of Sarbanes-Oxley fame. And, uh, and, uh, it, it, and Arthur Levitt took that, because it passed in a very bipartisan fashion, took that as his permission to go ahead and, uh, and, uh, and decimalize uh, securities without ever having to see a bill passed in the, uh, out of, it go through both houses of Congress and ultimately get to the president's desk. Now, this is a little bit of an eye chart, but real quick, uh, um, I want to show you, this is, this is dysfunction, okay? These are, you, the way the SEC is set up, there's five commissioners, right? There's the chairman, and there's typically two Democratic spots and two Republicans. One of the things you find is they don't want to make controversial decisions if there isn't balance, okay? And the other thing you, you, you find is that when you have an incomplete group, okay, they are waiting so that they have the kind of the moral authority of having a complete staff. So let me just show you here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is on the far left is the SEC chair. 
The last two have been independents. That's why we're in gray. Uh, the, the blue is Democrats, and the red is Republicans. So all the way up at the top, you have Mary Jo White. Uh, this is back in January of 2015. Louis Aguilar, uh, Kara Stein. And then the two Republicans were, uh, were uh, uh, Dan uh, Gallagher, and uh, I'm having a hard time reading it myself. And, uh, oh yeah, Mike Pivovar, he was the only micromarkets economist there. Um, now, so if you fast forward and you look, and these are, this is superimposed. This is the, this is the initial coin offering uh, issuance in the United States. And what you see is, is that it's, it's starting to really ramp in 2017. Jay Clayton is just joining. We've got gaps in terms of SEC staffing, so nothing happens. And then it's not until they have a full cadre of folks and, they're, and they've gotten their sea legs that you see uh, Jay Clayton say, I believe every initial coin offering I've seen is a security. This is in his Senate testimony. And poof, all of a sudden, the rate of issuance of ICOs starts to decrease, okay? So, <clears throat> you know, this is, you know, you, you, you run into a situation where there's really nobody you know, in, in a position to make a decision to forward, forward policy on this stuff, at least at the SEC, particularly on something which is, which is uh, very, going to be very, very controversial. Who's seen, uh, <clears throat> who's seen Howie Coins? Yeah, I'm sure John's seen it. Anybody know what Howie Coins is? It's the SEC spoof on a fraudulent token offering. Okay, you can get it, it's on the, they, they sponsor this, and they go through and they, you know, they give you, actually go through the site, you can get the, uh, the link is there. I think people have access to the slides, Diana? Yeah, I think you do, you can distribute them, but it's got the link there and you can look through it, it's kind of funny. I mean, you know, Howie Coins are officially registered with the U.S. government. Howie Coins will trade on an SEC compliant exchange where you can buy and sell them for profit, blah, 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 blah. It's complete, uh, it's a complete fabrication courtesy of your, own Securities and Exchange Commission, okay? But the bottom, the, the point was is that 80% of these ICOs that were conducted in 2017 were scams. And oh, by the way, there's 50 state regulators in this country, okay? And they can prosecute people for fraud. And fraud can be something which includes, you know, just complete material misstatements or, or omissions. And if you read any of the white papers that came out on a lot of these early blockchain ideas, I defy you to figure out in most instances what the hell you were buying. <clears throat> So where is regulation headed for blockchain? So I'm going to talk about INX, which was the company I said that has a, has a, a prospectus on file with the SEC. We're now approaching 20 months. It's actually public now. Originally, it was a confidentially filed uh, uh, registration statement. And it's both applying to be an exchange or alternative trading system and, uh, sorry for the typo, and to issue a token as a security, okay, to finance itself. So it's they, what we're finding is, is that the SEC is asking them to fit into traditional regulatory boxes with the exchanges, meaning that if you're, you know, you, you, they, they want to see discreetly you cut out, you can co-mingle tokens for anything, right? A token is a token is a token. You could, you could have a token there for a stock, you could have a token there for a derivative, you could have a token there for a currency, and they're largely indistinguishable, okay? And you can trade them on the same platform, but the SEC is saying don't trade them on the same platform, put them into, uh, separate buckets because that's how we regulate and we have only uh, purview over things that are securities, not derivatives, not currencies, okay? So the token issuance <clears throat> we're seeing is also is, is increasingly being held to the same standards as traditional securities and that's why the two major bugaboos have been we need you to, we need to ha have you find a transfer agent and we need to see relevant custody. We need the custody for the institutions to come in because if you lose a bunch of tokens that are on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, uh, a memory stick, okay, uh, and you're a fiduciary, you as a, an institution are probably not likely to invest in these kinds of uh, investments. And then finally, the sort of the $64 question, which is an important one, is can tokens ultimately be listed on a major exchange? Why is that important? Because the over-the-counter market is really restrictive and doesn't work particularly well, and when it, because of blue sky and state and state authorities. Whereas if you're in the large cap publicly registered market on a on a major stock exchange, 
you get, a, you get a national exchange exemption, which means that you're exempt from blue sky, which means, that, and, and that is jargon for, you really essentially uh, uh, preempt the state regulators. Uh, also, most of the major Wall Street firms won't allow people to purchase securities that are not listed on a major exchange. So that is, uh, uh, that, that's basically what I had to say. I think that, you know, this is very important technology. Uh, it is, uh, is going to disrupt an awful lot of businesses, but it's very important for the, uh, for the policymakers and the regulators to essentially really get their heads around it. Uh, because you, you don't want to wake up. If you've got a technology that's disintermediating intermediaries, then obviously there are chances, if, you know, with evildoers on non-regulated exchanges, uh, for you to finance terrorism. And, and when I say non-regulated exchanges, exchanges, if they're regulated, uh, are required you know, to know your customer. You have to know who's coming on board. But if you go from two unregulated exchanges and they don't have that requirement, you could very easily see somebody uh, who is uh, trying to finance terrorism, the drug trade, or, or worse, um, transferring uh, crypto uh, back and forth between two sites. And this is something that I know for a fact that the House Oversight Committee has been keenly interested in. When I was down there in December, they let me fly that they'd seen a billion dollars worth of crypto show, because uh, you can see it on the general ledger, uh, but they didn't know who it was, go from Venezuela into Switzerland. And so these are the kinds of things that were obviously causing regulators uh, 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 some indigestion. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Thank you. minutes to mic up the next speakers, and then we're going to start our panel rather soon.
started. Am I going, am I going here? Am I going next to you? Or? Danny, you want me next to you? Yeah, okay. Okay. We're back on. So I'm going to introduce the three speakers that we have. I think they're awesome. I think the world of each and every one of them. <laughs> John D'Agostino here is the managing director of the world's largest fund governance firm, DMS Governance. He's also on several boards of companies um, providing independent oversight. And he has prior experience heading the strategy initiatives of the New York Mercantile Exchange, where his work was the focus of two best-selling books, not one, two. And he's also a frequent speaker on topics of next generation FinTech, AI, and blockchain. Next up, Francis Stacy is known as a technical genius. Uh, she is, has an awesome ability uh, to explain complex subject matter in simple terms, and she predicted the stock market crash back in 2008, um, where she got out of stocks and went into the historic gold trade. And now she is head of portfolio strategy at Optimal Capital, and she also appears frequently in Fox Business News, CNBC, CBS, and a number of other national and local television shows uh, commenting on the markets. And finally, Ken Lang is a tech visionary and inventor. He um, is a pioneer in AI and machine learning, and he invented search engine methodology and collaborative filtering. Um, he also developed and commercialized technology in, in different levels, with holding different C-level positions, and he founded a number of different companies. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, his most <coughs> recent project in the blockchain space with the Endow Collective. So if, I think if you three could uh, introduce yourselves a little bit further in terms of providing more context into why and how you're involved in the blockchain space, and we can go around and take it from there. Uh, sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll go in order. Um, I'm, uh, I'm the one who's not a genius or a visionary. Uh, so <laughs> my first order of business enthusiast. is to rewrite my bio. Uh, my most, actually, my favorite thing to introduce myself is I'm one of like 37 Americans left who have not done a TED Talk. That's, that's my favorite, <laughs> favorite introduction. Um, so, okay, so why am I here? Uh, I'm here because um, I, I occupy this, this kind of unique space uh, of, of former uh, large exchange derivatives executives who um, still are uh, have to work because they didn't get in, into the IPO early enough. Uh, and so um, I've had a good relationship with regulators over the last uh, five or seven years uh, because I understand how these sort of complex, uh, uh, these complex derivatives, complex instruments tend to uh, create liquidity pools. So that sort of lended itself pretty well to this cryptocurrency movement. And then uh, I started studying it, uh, looking into it. I advised uh, a company very early on called Second Market, which became Bitcoin Trust. And, and uh, so learned a bit about it and then um, had an ongoing dialogue Dialogue with the SEC and FCA uh, on this, and then that led to a couple of board positions with some very large uh, blockchain firms. Uh, and so what I do, uh, and I think the regulators appreciate this, is I, I occupy a unique space in the ecosystem where I'm a fiduciary to investors. So, so my opinion as to the underlying fundamental value of these assets, I have one, but it's largely irrelevant. My job is to make sure that uh, sophisticated institutional investors who choose to invest in these assets are not defrauded. Uh, so that's the kind of the lens with which I am uh, looking at it. Great. Um, I'm an old school technical analysis type girl. And um, I did, I predicted the financial crisis and did trade it. And so now when I look at some of these assets emerging, I kind of take, try to take the new school and look at it through the lens of the old school and try to ascertain some sort of sustainability. I've also spent the better part of a decade, um, I'm <laughs> aging myself here, but the better part of a decade uh, studying central banking and monetary policy and the business cycle specifically um, to really understand the underlying mechanics because I wanted to know what, you know, what, what are some of the things that are markers along the way in some of the transitions between the different cycles. And I don't know that I'm a genius, but <laughs> I like to look at these things very carefully. I'm speaking through the lens of an allocator and you know, what it would take to have our billion and a half dollars be interested in these new assets. 
So, uh, so I'm the Chief Technology Officer at, at uh, Cosmo Ventures, and uh, we're investing in, uh, in blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies, but I'm also a member of the Endow Collective. And um, a little background on what Endow is, because to set some context, it's a long-term store of value uh, cryptocurrency, digital asset, uh, but it's, it, it is designed a little differently. We call it a, a buoyant, a, the first buoyant digital currency. Uh, its, its aim is to solve a lot of the issues we see with volatility and governance and other, other problems with the existing cryptocurrency options and digital asset options out there now. And um, I thought I'd, I'd also mention just a little bit to maybe set some context too for the, the, the title of our panel, right, about hype uh, and what business models work uh, from the venture capital perspective too. Uh, so, so a lot of folks, you know, back in the, in the 90s when we were all doing the, the internet bubble thing, um, you know, people would say, oh, I'm just gonna take this and I'm gonna put it on the internet, now give me my venture capital money. And uh, that worked a lot of times, but it didn't really result in necessarily a, a good uh, business model for a company to be successful. And we're seeing that same thing happen again, right, where people say, I'm going to put this on the blockchain now, now, you know, raise some money and try to try to do something with that. And so I think you need a better filter than that, obviously, if you want uh, if you want successful companies to be sustainable and, and really create value. And so I thought I'd uh, mention a little bit about what the lens is that we use to do that and separate the hype from the things that work. And the first thing you have to do is kind of say, well, a lot of people will tell you, right, that a blockchain is just another kind of database, except it's you know, something that's maybe a little more, uh, uh, it's a little more transparent, a little more accountable, a little more difficult for somebody to go in and tamper with it and do shenanigans with it. Um, and that's, that's true, but what is it really good for, right? Um, and, and if somebody says, hey, I'm just gonna put something on the blockchain, could, could an answer be to that, just put it on a database? You don't need a blockchain. A blockchain is a very expensive kind of database to do because you're replicating it massively. There's a whole lot of things that have to go with it. So what, what I want to do is just put out there the idea that don't think of, of blockchain as just a new kind of database. I think it's actually something much bigger. Um, I think that we see in our civilization a, um, a uh, a, a, a lack of confidence in our institutions. And blockchain, think of that as a, it's a building block of, of new kinds of institutions that can be done. Institutions that can be trusted better. Institutions where everybody can be participating in them. Where we have a consensus and a set of rules that achieve uh, a, a set of truths, if you will, in, that, in a blockchain that we can all agree on, that we know hasn't been tampered with if they're designed correctly. And whether it's something like Endow or a, you know, a, a monetary system as an institution or the other kinds of institutions that can interact with something like Endow, right, a, a digital governance uh, institution or an identity institution or a dispute resolution institution or we have one called an epistemology institution, right, the study of how do you know what's true and reaching consensus on truth. And all of these kinds of institutions are really where blockchain, I think, delivers a lot of value. So any application you're thinking about or you're seeing somebody um, offer to you uh, as a potentially future successful blockchain, think about whether as an institution, that organization, that group, that platform is doing a good job in the non-blockchain world already or whether there's some shenanigans happening or people aren't trusting it or there's, unfair, there's an unfair playing field out there. And that's maybe a ripe opportunity for where blockchain can improve things and create more value. Awesome. So. I think, Francis, given those points, you could add further on what structures need to exist for these projects to be sustainable. Yeah, I'll just sort of extrapolate upon the point of institutions and trust. And I look at this from a lot of really historical cycles. And you know, there is a lot of mistrust in institutions, but this has happened before. And the instances of populism on the right and the left have happened before. And if you guys are interested in that, there's a lot of great studies by Ray Dalio. But in any case, um, I, w I had the great pleasure of attending the 75th anniversary of Bretton Woods. And most of you probably know that that was when the World Bank was created and the IMF was created. And it was really interesting because you had these two uh, sides. You know, you had these sort of traditional central bankers, members of the IMF, and 
you know, former Fed governors and things like that. And then on the other side, you had these sort of blockchain people who had this sort of anarchist vision for these, for these traditional institutions, you know? And it was so funny to listen to the divergent views. And on the IMF side, it was like, wait a second, when we negotiated this, the US was this economic superpower and they got so many advantages in that negotiation because of where we were, you know, as a percentage of global GDP. And now you come over and the blockchain people are telling us what's wrong about the system. And we, even Larry Summers was there defending the IMF, which was really fun. Um, but what I realized in listening to these divergent backgrounds is that you can't really, I think it's more effective instead of just completely disrupting the existing institutions is to work with them and innovate alongside of them because they, number one, have all of the legislation and all of the statutory law, but also common law, all of the precedent there legally, and they have all of the legal authority to either turn you on or turn you off. And uh, so I think that that's really important. So I left there thinking, yes, there are things that are broken about central banking. There are inefficiencies in monetary policy, which we're going to experience in the fourth quarter of this year. Um, but I think it's really important for somebody to come along with a stable coin or some sort of thing where you innovate the central banks rather than try and disrupt them, because I think the disruption is going to be chaotic. Okay, and Ken, what are your thoughts on uh, these lines in terms of especially finding a middle ground between yeah, uh, so, you know, I know lots of sort of the rogue libertarian, you know, crypto punks right out there that want to just tear everything down and replace it with, uh, with blockchain. And I also know uh, a lot of people in public policy and, 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 uh, and in governance that they're, they're trying to defend what's, what's really working well in our institutions and don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so, you know, really to design these systems in a way where, you know, you're not starting, you know, at, at uh, you know, on, on square zero and having to learn the hard way why certain things are done the way they are in the, in the regular institutional world, I think you kind of have to bring to bear experience from, all, from a lot of different disciplines to do it. And you really got to have people that have the, uh, the understanding of why things are done the way they are now and whether there's legitimate reasons for a lot of those things, which there are. And there, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. It doesn't have to be, well, we're just gonna do blockchain and crypto everything's gonna be done by cryptography and whether you can control a private key or not. And there's, there's you know, there's uh, a dogma like the code is the law, right? And, and stuff like that that you'll hear in the, in the blockchain world. And is it really, is, is, is the code really the law? Is that really how we want to operate in, in civilization? Because that does give an advantage to, you know, to, to the geeks of the world, but uh, that's probably not how the rest of humanity wants to see, see it operate. Um, so what are, what are the opportunities, though, in the middle ground, right? It, that's the hardest place to go, right? It's easier if, if you just have to write code and whatever the code does, you know, good or bad, then it is. And it's easier to just stick with the status quo. But what if you can kind of take the best of both worlds? I think that is the big unexplored space. It's harder to do because you've got to know a lot about both sides and you have to figure out how do I integrate the best of both of those worlds and maybe improve on them both in the process. But we think that's, in the long run, that's where the real opportunity is. Can I just expand upon that yeah. just super quickly? Sorry, John, stealing your thunder. Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, to be specific, um, let's talk about central banking just really briefly. Um, what is the role of the central bank? So few crypto people can answer this question. And the role of the central bank is to control the money supply. And in controlling the money supply, you're controlling both inflationary pressures and deflationary pressures. So in order to do that, you have to have some elastic mechanism in the money supply. You have to be able to put money out in circulation and add to the money supply and bring money back in circulation to reduce the money supply in the case of managing inflation. So the definition of inflation just being simply um, too much money relative to goods, and the definition of deflation simply too many goods, not enough money to pay for them. So you have to manage the money supply in order to match the goods and services available. And so you, know, you have somebody come along with a stable coin or some idea about this, and I say, well, what are you going to do to manage inflation? Huh? We're going to disrupt the central bank, OK? What are you going to do to manage deflation? 
we're going to disrupt the central bank. You know what I'm saying? So structurally, you have to understand the reason that these institutions came into existence and why they have the legal authority and the powers that they have. So that's a specific example. John, what can you say? I know you have a lot of thoughts about hype. What doesn't work? Yeah, I, mean, I don't know how I got to this point in my life where um, I, I used to be the revolutionary. Like I, I, this, these books that were written about me was because I was lucky enough to be there when people used to do this on trading floors and we shifted to electronic trading. And, and um, I remember all the inertia and the people, going, I, I got punched in the back of the head on the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange because the tr floor traders thought I was going to steal their job. I used to be that guy. And now I'm teaching a class uh, at, at nameless universities uh, that uh, called um, uh, Separating Hype from Reality or uh, Cynical Enthusiasm. And so I don't know how I became the grumpy old man in the room. But, but you know, uh, you mentioned code is law. Code is law is one of my three least favorite uh, phrases because uh, it's not. Law, law, is, law is not immutable. A law changes, law evolves, law, law you know, we, if we had the same laws we had 100 years ago, we'd have big, big problems. So code is the opposite of law, and it's immutable. Um, my other big concerns um, around some of the hyperbole um, are they, they, they're potentially damaging, right? So, so burning everything to the ground works really well when you have the privilege of viewing the fire safely um, in, from, in comfort. Uh, burning things to the ground do not work well if you're one of the underprivileged who, who need these goods and services. So, um, you know, uh, you hear a lot about financial inclusion relative to cryptocurrencies. And because I'm not a genius or revolutionary, I can be very sort of empirical and, and sophomoric and very narrow. Uh, I care about uh, these, these, these financial assets being created. Uh, David made a, a very, very good point before, far more eloquent than I, than I can, which is this notion that everything will suddenly become magically liquid because you decrease the friction associated with the transaction um, is, is carnival barksmanship, if that's a word I'll just make up. Uh, putting bad things on a block, selling your awful product doesn't become easier because you make it, you, you decrease the friction associated with your awful product because it's still awful. Um, and so that, that that's, that's nonsense. And anyone who tries to sell you that, anyone who tries to sell financial inclusion as one of the, the, the benefits of cryptocurrencies, yes, because that's what very, very poor people need, not food, water, medical care. They need access to really awful ICOs uh, and bad early stage companies. So, so that's, that's nonsense. Now, where it becomes really, really interesting, I think, are, for me at least, are two, again, very narrow areas. Um, it, well, first, from that being said, if, if uh, you know, Bitcoin as a, as a, as a virtual gold uh, store of value, um, there's there's nothing wrong with, with, with financial institutions trading that and speculating on that. I, you know, I, I have questions about the underlying fundamental value of that asset, but uh, you, know, you met my five-year-old and my two-year-old daughters. The notion that when they're my, my age, there won't be some digital store of value is as ludicrous to me as uh, some of the ICO stuff happening. So there will be something. Whether it's Bitcoin or something else, I'm not sure. Um, high latency. High latency uh, periodic transactions translate really, really well to blockchains. Uh, uh, they're not manually intensive or, or um, uh, computationally intensive, and so the notion that we should put these 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 high frequent uh, low sorry, high, I'm sorry low frequency high latency transactions onto these blockchains, whether it's personal identity or similar things, is huge potential there. Um, enormous potential, I think. I'm trying to be positive. Enormous potential in digital intangible assets. You know, non. I don't know why the world's so obsessed with tackling the securities world, which is fraught with regulation, fraught with but the I mean, Fortnite. Fortnite made more money, more profit than Amazon, excluding Amazon Web Services last year, by selling skins. Who knows what skins are? The young crowd, you all know what skins are. I, I, I say that in older crowds, and, they're, they're, and, they're, and they're, I put up a picture of a rabbit armor, uh, and everyone laughs. But I wore Zeke Cabaricis when I was in, in eighth grade, and those are more ridiculous than rabbit armor. But they were a physical manifestation of the identity I wanted to present. And my 13-year-old nephew desperately wants the $75 rabbit armor skin, and there's no reason why that won't have even more residual value than a deteriorating piece of fabric. So there's billions and potentially trillions of dollars of unlocked value in these digital intangible assets um, that we'll be able to kind of break, you know, break out using, using blockchain technology. I, I, I question whether or not targeting securities uh, in the early stages is, is worth it. Right. So I want to take a break here and see if we have any questions from the audience. Or we can. OK, Kelly. Um, I love every point of view here. Um, Should I just, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, my question is, if you have, um, if you're putting money into uh, the system and flooding the system with, let's say, dollars, um, and, and you have a cryptocurrency that y you only have a cap number of cryptocurrencies, um, how do you guys see, anybody can answer this question, how do you guys see uh, rehypothecation with um, future cryptocurrencies um, or even the lending uh, aspect of cryptocurrencies? And I ask that just to fuel the fire a little bit. <laughs> I can take that. Go ahead, start. <laughs> um, yeah, so we go back. This is where I'm really going to geek out. Sorry, you guys. No, we go back to the Coinage Act of 1873 when they demonetized silver in favor of gold. And we look at, and this is actually law on the books. Um, so we look at this and we say, why did they do that? And actually, it hurt America greatly because America had a larger supply of silver and England had a larger supply of gold. But the reason that they did that was to regulate this ratio between money and goods and services. And so they wanted to have one yardstick. And that is buried deep in our you know, portals of legislation on currency. And so to your question, if I understand it correctly, is bringing on additional cryptocurrencies in order to increase the supply? Is that your question of money? Yes, obviously you can't increase the supply of Bitcoin and, and the, the debt aspect of Bitcoin is not there. Right. Um, and I'm just curious what your take is on other crypto or all of your takes on other cryptocurrencies becoming uh, utilized for utilizing debt or... or, or um, I or love lending. this question. <laughs> so back to the fundamental role of the central bank. The central bank uses debt as a way of making the money supply elastic, which is the which is the purpose of the central bank. So that you, you know, if you just continuously add to the money supply, you just create endless opportunities for inflation and you should have bought everything yesterday. And none of us want that, right? Because then it's just sort of an ageist sort of discrimination, right? So that's the thing is debt, when it matures, when, it, when it's issued, it goes out on the books, it's part of the money supply. When it matures, it actually comes back in and evaporates and disappears. So that's, so when debt matures, that's how it, um, you know, that's how there's an elasticity in the money supply. So if you're going to disrupt that and say that there are some sinister aspects of debt, which I completely agree with you, right? Debt picks winners and losers in many cases. Um, if you're the creditor versus the borrower, particularly in a deflationary period, the borrowers get very, very hurt. That was the financial crisis in 2008. But if you're going to re replace that elasticity and you're going to say, look, we don't want the cancer of debt, but you have to, if you're going to disrupt that function, you have to understand what debt does that is beneficial to the society. And so if you bring endless amounts of cryptocurrency, you're going to buck against those laws. If you have all these different cryptocurrencies and they're not defined as securities, which is, I think, why they were relegated to securities, is you're going to have all these different yardsticks. And then the central organization is going to say, hey, we can't control the money supply. And hey, we can't you know, protect you from inflation and deflation. Now, some people think they protect us from that. Some people think they create that. Whatever you think, that is sort of their legal role. And um, so as cryptocurrencies emerge, and certainly any cryptocurrency that doesn't have an adjustable supply is going to have a really hard time you know, disrupting that. Uh, one of the panels at Bretton Woods, we had a crypto person, we had a gold bug, and we had a guy from, you know, a regular sort of IMF guy from the University of Chicago. And it was just really funny. So the gold bug was like, well, the gold supply is growing at one and a half percent every year. And, in, <laughs> and the population is growing at one and a half percent every year. So this is going to control the money supply, right? Well, I'm just not going to place my bets that no, that's never going to change, right? There are too many variables to measure in how the gold supply occurs and how population occurs. So that's the thing is you need to have this elasticity in the money supply. So if you have a finite money supply and you're going to try and take that technology and disrupt it into being the currency that we know, and you have a fluctuating number of goods, then obviously you're going to buck against that ratio. I, I've always wondered this. So what's the difference between a, a, a finite, and if you have a, a, a limitless money supply, but what if you have a finite money supply that can be infinitely fractionalized? Are they, is, that, is there a difference? Um, well, infinitely fractionalized, that's like putting, well, 
it's like putting us back on the gold standard where we yeah. have three million dollar coins, the right? The we have three million dollar coins to represent yep. the trillions and trillions of dollars. I mean, I think in theory it could be infinitely fractionalized. I think you get into some very fun math there, but um, yeah, I think in theory it could be. I, if you I could di dilute it enough, you could sort of um, devalue the currency. John has a no. comment. Oh, uh, I was yeah. going to say, I, I think part of the answer is we have to disentangle a little bit why, uh, you know, what money is, right, from an abstract sense, right? Uh, it's classically defined as having three purposes, right? It's a, it's a store of value, it's a medium of exchange, um, and, and it's a, um, uh, uh, what's, what's the third thing? Yeah, um, what's that? Unit of account. Yeah, and a unit of account, of course. Um, and so, um, you know, when, when you have one currency for an entire country that's mandated by that country to be its official currency, you're, you're trying to have a one-size-fits-all currency that has to solve a lot of different constraints about uh, employment and the economy and the trade balance, and you're trying to balance all these different things that sometimes are in conflict with one another. But a cryptocurrency doesn't have to be something that's just for one country, and in, there can be many of them within in that country. So I think the issues that the two of you are, are talking about uh, um, and, and were brought up in the question also kind of have to do with once you decouple these purposes, you can, you can do things that weren't possible before. So you can have, so when deflation is a problem, right, for a national currency in that if everybody is, say, is thinking, hey, I want to hold on to this currency, it's going up in value relative to other things, then you don't have economic activity being stimulated. So, and people, because people aren't buying things, they're not investing in things. And you see the you see that economic activity go down. That's bad for their economy. But if Bitcoin is going up and it's and it's not the currency of a country, it's fine if if the value of Bitcoin is going up like that. So you can have a store of value, especially a long-term store of value uh, currency like Endow, that can go up as fast as you want. It's not going to affect that, and deflation isn't a problem. Uh, and, and as uh, uh, John mentioned, um, it because you can fractionalize it as much as you want, that's that's not an issue either. Um, but if you if you have specific um, uh, if you have specific debts that you need to pay, um, uh, then you want something that is something that's uh, more stable. Um, if you are once want to have something that you can use for lots of different purposes without going through some kind of exchange, then it needs to be the common medium of exchange currency that everybody's willing to accept and have maximum distribution and acceptability. Um, but if you, if you uh, want to have something that is a good unit of account so that we can compare as a candlestick across many things and in accounting be able to look at, that, look at how different things have relative value with one another, then it's got to be stable over time and, and you, need that, you need that unit of account stability for it because if it's wild, wildly going up and down like Bitcoin, you know, is an egg worth you know, this much of a Bitcoin or that much of a Bitcoin? Well, it depends on you know, when you refresh your browser. Um, and that's, that's, that's a problem for using Bitcoin for that unit of account purpose. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, thanks, uh, uh, thanks a lot uh, to Francis in particular for talking about elasticity I, and for going back to the basics. I think it's fundamental. I think there's no such thing as elasticity of uh, supply and, and or, uh, deflation and, and, and inflation if the money itself is not backed by the full faith and credit of a government that, or a country, an economy, uh, that, uh, that is not stable, that, that cannot back it. Uh, that's, that's the fundamental definition of what money is. Uh, and if you, if you don't have that, if you don't have, if a cryptocurrency is not backed by something, somebody, that is credible, then it cannot play the role of a regulator of deflation and inflation. It cannot play the role of elasticity. It, it, it just, it's nothing. It's like having a paper in the hand. It's like the Deutschmark after Second World War. We think that's part of the answer, right? So you, there, there should be there should be some reserves that can be used for that. Just as the Fed, you know, will, does quantitative easing and then reverses it with that that balance sheet, that's part of their monetary policy. But it's both the assets that can help support the stability and monetary policy itself, whether those assets are used or that policy or not. <laughs> those to get have to work together. So at the the cryptocurrency that that we've put out, Endow, for example, it's named for an endowment of assets that underlie it and help can help support the value. 
And, and we kind of had you know, uh, Yale in mind, actually, the Yale endowment model for how that's invested and how this could be used for endowments. So there's a lot of tie in there. But, um, but we agree with you. But, my, but I think you know, to, to uh, uh, Francis's point, uh, monetary policy isn't just the assets underneath it. It, it, it is things like what are the rules that, and the, the, the debts that help contract that supply and create demand for it, independent of, the, the, of a country backing it with its full faith and credit. Um, I, I see your point, but here, I mean, with as far as a dollar is concerned, or, or hard currencies are concerned, there's no such thing as asset backing them. It's just the full faith and credit of that country. There's, there are no assets. The assets don't devalue or, or, or change in, in, in value. So that's where it's tricky because if you're backing the, uh, the coins, the, the bitcoins with assets that can devalue or can have no value tomorrow, then you're in trouble. Yeah. Yep. So we have another question. Uh, thank, thank you for the uh, conversation. It's excellent. Uh, I just want a little clarification. We have the opportunities here to have competing currencies. That is something we, Bretton Woods didn't give us, uh, going back to the Keynesian, you know, the gold standard now. But we have an opportunity to have a competing currency which will make things efficient and so on. Are you looking at regulating that competition uh, by some authority, or how would that play? Regulating it with a cryptocurrency? Uh, uh, yeah, regulating the competition. What, what would determine? Oh, between the, between the currencies? Yeah. Well, uh, Bretton Woods and, and, of course, the IMF, one of the things about the banking structure is you always have to have the lender of last resort, right? Because any system that's built on debt, you have to have you know, banking institutions and you have to go up the line. And that's one of the reasons that the IMF was created. And there's another acronym, the SDR, Special Drawing Rights, which you know, obviously was designed for that purpose. It was sort of to be the, re so the US dollar was the reserve currency and then the SDRs were gonna back the US dollar and, that, and then you tether sort of all the other currencies against the US dollar and that's how you value them. Um, I think what I've seen thus far with cryptocurrencies is they are trying to tether to something um, I don't know that it's been established what they're going to tether to, but in order to make a general comparison of value, you have to have something to compare it against in order to establish how, you know, that's why we use, um, what's the word I'm looking for, <laughs> benchmarks in investing. We have to have some, you know, sort of authority and say, well, how does something perform against that authority? So if you talk about a multitude of cryptocurrencies, and certainly to your point, you know, I've seen these sort of hybrids between crypto and U.S. dollar for that reason, right? So that you can tap into the law that's on the books with regards to the full faith and credit of the U.S. Treasury. Um, so when you say multi a multitude of cryptocurrencies, it's going to have to have some tethering point in order to be evalu evaluated against one another. Did I answer that at all? Uh, I was more concerned about who's going to regulate the competition. Uh, that was one. The second Competition is, between, oh, between the Fed or the SEC, currency oh, versus security. You saying regulate the Gone competition? The co <laughs> competition between what? Amongst the currencies. I mean, well, I mean, if you talk, uh, I mean, these would these would be extra extra jurisdictions. I mean, again, I'm not a proponent of this, but the, but the people who propagate these theories will believe these are actually extra uh, extra extra territorial. They would not there would not be any the regulatory the regulatory body would be the the, the marketplace. I mean, if, so. Um, how do you how do you regulate? First of all, there's no there's no centralized server. The, these are these are decentralized. So there's no regulatory body that would have that would have access or control over this multitude of currencies. Um, so I, I don't know who I don't know who would be able to to regulate that. I mean, the, the regulatory bodies would handle um, just like the SEC is now uh, would have you know far reaching to anyone who's transacting with a U.S. entity or a banking entity uh, for AML or, or money laundering purposes. But um, I, I think in that in that world where you have uh, hundreds or thousands or even millions of potential uh, stores of value competing with each other, um, then there would be uh, it'd be difficult to understand which regulatory agency would have jurisdiction over over all of them. That uh, there is a possibility that a cryptocurrency could be a monopoly. Do you currency uh, I, Again, I, I, in this world, in this world where they've displaced the U.S. dollar, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not following what what the what the question is. No, uh, let let's say Bitcoin, you know, 
supersedes Bicar. As a currency or a store of value? Uh, as a currency. As a currency. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't think that's possible, so I, I'll, I'll defer yeah, that. There's, to there, there's certainly a, a, a subculture of uh, Bitcoin believers called Bitcoin maximalists, and this is exactly what they believe. They think Bitcoin was the first, it's all we're ever going to need, and we just need to keep putting out that propaganda until Bitcoin overtakes everything and everything else goes away. So that's what they believe. Um, we, we've, we created Endow because we don't see that happening. And we don't think Bitcoin is the ultimate answer. As brilliant uh, of an invention as it is, uh, it's led the way and, show, and, and been a fantastic experiment that's showed a lot of things, but it's also shown where there's issues with it. And those issues probably can't get fixed within Bitcoin itself, but may get fixed through competition and people doing new and better experiments to fix what we've learned in, in that experiment. I, I will tell one anecdote about I will tell one anecdote about, about regulation because I was speaking in, in Malaysia at the Malaysian Securities Commission conference and it was a very, very high-end conference and they had the head of the Securities Commission, they had the, the current, there's a rotating sultan, the sultan of Malaysia there and they had this you know, army, literally like seven or 10 army individuals with big machine guns behind them, protecting them, big show of force. And I was on a panel with uh, an, an unnamed company, but a very, very, very big crypto company, company you've all heard of. And uh, Farid Zakaria was the moderator and, and he, um, and he and turned to me, and the last thing this guy said before he turned to me was, and it doesn't matter because they can't stop it. And then he turns to me, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at the army guys, and I'm looking at Sullivan, looking at, and my opening house, I, I counting eight people that could absolutely stop it. And it was, it was sort of tongue in cheek, but, <laughs> but I think we've seen this before. Uh, remember online poker? Online poker was you know, vibrant and wonderful, and then one day in around 2011, a bunch of guys woke up with machine guns pointed at their heads in Belize, New York, Tokyo, and other places, try getting an online poker game game going these days. So, so I, think, I think the issue of the issue of these things can't be stopped by regulators is, is one that's often offered by maximalists. Uh, and the reality is um, when you start to threaten, uh, you know, threaten you know, the foundation of a monetary system, I think you'll find very quickly, you can, there's, there's two T1 lines connecting most countries to the internet. You can just snip them if you need to. So there is ways to control this. Um, and I think if we, got, if we get away from these, these tokens being stores of value and representative of, of kind of known instruments, and we start to move towards really threatening monetary systems, I think you'll see how quickly they can all be shut down. Yeah, and the Fed just has, they have the legal authority to control the money supply. Um, so they're gonna either, you're either gonna have to take the machine guns and point it at them and disrupt them out of business that way, or they're gonna have a say. And based on what they're saying about Libra and the central banking commentary in general, I think we can predict with a high level of certainty that they're very um, hesitant. That doesn't make sense, but you guys got it, right? OK, good. <laughs> awesome. Any more questions? No, we'll take a longer break, but go ahead. So, so far, the discussion has been about cryptocurrencies and securities, blockchain implement, you know, applications in those areas, which in John, in your terms, these are all low latency, high frequency transactions. And then you also alluded to applicability of blockchain for high latency, low frequency transactions. So what is the regulatory interface in those areas? So high frequency, low latency transactions. Um, and, yeah, I mean, did, the yeah. discussion has been about high frequency, low latency transactions like cryptocurrencies. Right. Yep. Whereas you said, you know, the applicability of blockchain is more in a high latency, low frequency transaction area. Well, that's where I think the, the value of immutable truth is really, really interesting, right? So, so I was at the OECD uh, about six months ago at a blockchain conference, and you know, two, two things struck me. One is all the attempts to use uh, blockchain to store digital identity in children, right? So human trafficking of children is a massive problem. So if you can combine um, you know, the fantastic research happening at places like Yale and MIT around uh, ascertaining personal identity through multivariable analytics. So it's easy, you know, people can, you can fake even I you can fake fingerprint, you can fake, but it's very difficult to fake all those things. And so if we can get to a point where technology allows, you know, a good approximation of human identity, um, and you can put those on cheap devices, you can save lots and lots of kids. That's fascinating. Um, the other thing I thought was really interesting, there was a gentleman uh, from China who was talking about tracking the provenance of rice on a blockchain. And what was, I, I'm not smart enough, he understands technology, I don't, but what really is interesting is that the market price of that rice sells for 2x in Chinese marketplaces. So, so to me, that's fascinating as a market technician and as, 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 as there's, there's brand value behind blockchain. So whether or not it's a better database, 
I'll let I'll get guys like Ken figure that out, because I, I can't. But what I can say is, at some point, it doesn't really matter. If people believe it's a better database and they trust it to a point where they're willing to pay two times the price because they believe that rice is not contaminated, that has transformative value in society. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there in case you want to comment on that. Yeah, I, I think um, there, you know, we have a real problem out there with uh, people influencing and uh, perception of truth. And people influence perception of truth for political reasons, for financial reasons, uh, and for, for other reasons. But what we should be influencing it for is to make tr the, the truth more accurate, uh, more agreed upon by everybody. And if it's something like rice, right, the, what they're paying 2x for is, is, is seeing a, a process that they can trust that is the truth about where it came from, as opposed to rice that may have come from some place that might be contaminated or have some kind of risk to it. And, it, and it's worth it to them. So I think that the more that you know, we, you think, and, and that, that gets back to the institution question. If you think about the rice market as an institution and the provenance of it as a part of that institution, showing what is the truth of, of, its, of its growth and development and, and transport and knowing whether it's safe to eat and nutritious and so on, that's, that's, what, uh, that's where the value of it gets created. We have one minute left, so. I think this oh. gentleman had a comment. Oh, is, no. Yeah. No, you don't want to talk anymore? It passed? The moment's gone? Okay. Oh. Ships, ships in the night, yeah. So now we're going to take a break. I think there's some appetizers outside. Is it 10, 15 minutes? Okay. Yeah, and then we'll be back. Thank you, guys.
another panel now on regulatory issues. We just talked about the business and economic issues. And I already introduced John. I'll introduce Jeff briefly. I sometimes joke around with him that he knows everything about everything because he won Jeopardy five times. <laughs> but most recently, he's the CEO of Block Agent, which is a transfer agent that he'll talk about. And he also has done a lot of amazing things on the regulatory side. He used to be a CFTC regulator and FinTech advisor. So he knows a lot of the regulators. And he's literally coming from DC just now. And um, he also co-founded Global Digital Finance, GDF, which is one of the industry associations in the blockchain space, working to kind of crowdsource policy for having better standards for exchanges, stable coins, and a number of different topics that are relevant in this space. So welcome, Jeff. We're glad to have you. And welcome again, John. Um, so why don't we start if you tell us a little bit more about Block Agent and what you're envisioning. Uh, sure, yeah, thanks. It's always great to be at Yale. Thanks for inviting me. And I was uh, always happy to be here. I was an, I was an undergrad uh, here, Pearson, class of 84. I guess a lot of you may be grad students. and. Uh, one of my uh, most memorable afternoons was graduation. Uh, when I uh, had the honor of walking the Yale Bulldog during the graduation ceremony. Handsome Dan, eight or, eight or nine. So um, yeah, always good memories here. Yeah, so, uh, so Block Agent is, a, uh, is a, a new business that I started researching uh, last year and founded earlier this year. And, and really kind of the, the framework to look at it is uh, that, that um, you know, a lot, there's a lot of new opportunities around uh, tokenization, crypto assets, you know, these, these, these natively digital things that, that are, you know, ultimately programmable software. And, you know, I think kind of the, the, the last panel talked a bit about some of the value propositions and how we've sort of gone from the, the internet of information to the internet of, of value. And so kind of looking at that uh, ecosystem, you know, I think that there's, uh, you know, a need to develop kind of, uh, kind of the infrastructure to go with it, but to develop infrastructure that, that operates in a new way. Um, you know, I think that, and you know, maybe this is just a reflection of the fact that I've been on the regulated side of things, but particularly when you're talking about kind of people's monies, you know, retail investors, uh, you know, the idea that you're gonna completely do away without, you know, intermediaries or kind of trusted entities and all, in all circumstances, I think, you know, here in this, in this country, at least, you know, certain types of things are regulated, particularly when it comes to retail investor uh, protection. Um, so, so Block Agent uh, does one of the most like mundane, kind of unexciting kind of things in that space, but I think it's kind of a necessary element uh, to kind of adapt a traditional function to these new markets to promote uh, investor protection and safety. So a transfer agent does kind of a, a few things in traditional markets. One of the things it does is it keeps track of who the owner of record is. Now you say, doesn't the blockchain do that? Yeah, the blockchain does do that. But in our structure, again, you need somebody to just kind of check that the blockchain is working. And in fact, the way that the regulator kind of looks at it, it's the record that's maintained by this transfer agent, uh, which is an off-chain record uh, that, that is the kind of the golden source of truth. And I think someday, you know, as we evolve over time, the regulators will have greater trust for on-chain records, but again, in the kind of the securities space where retail investors in particular are involved, that's a necessary function. Uh, the second thing that it does is it um, associates wallet is, wallets uh, with identities. And again, the, in order to have kind of an orderly, safe, and trusted market with appropriate AML, KYC, you, you need a, a, an entity to do that. You know, an issuer of securities could do that. But again, it's kind of a, a function that's kind of repeated, so there's efficiency in, in outsourcing it. And then the third thing, and this is really one of the most kind of counterintuitive things, and I usually have to explain this a, a few times because it's not what people are familiar with with, with digital assets. Um, yes, yeah, everybody's questioning this, even the natively digital generation. Um, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not their daddy, though. I'm sure. <laughs> um, so. Um, so the, the third thing it does is it provides recourse. Uh, and you know, as I think people know, that if, um, if your Bitcoin or Ether or certain you know, uh, crypto assets are gone, they're just gone. Uh, and uh, there's, there's not really a way to, to do them. And you might be able to trace them, which the blockchain does. And you know, just similar to you know, with kind of traditional uh, financial assets when you know, the, the 
Bank of Bangladesh's account at the Federal Reserve gets hacked through an endpoint security thing, and so then the funds, and you can sort of trace them to here, to there, to the Philippines, to a casino, and they're, they're gone. But at least you can follow them, but you can't get them back in that case. So the other thing that a trans <clears throat> transfer agent can do for blockchain-based digital securities is actually if, there's a if, you, if an investor has lost their private key or um, you know, has otherwise a claim of lost or stolen securities, the smart contracts for blockchain-based digital securities are built in a way so that the transfer agent can freeze them while the claim is being investigated. And if it's proven, then it can restore your tokens to you. It can burn and reissue, or it can transfer those. So there's actually a very critical investor protection feature, which is different from other digital assets. And that's kind of part of the uh, regulatory framework. The SEC put out some, and FINRA put out uh, some staff statements uh, earlier this summer, and it was full of references to, to CIPIC, which is the insurance company, and clean audit opinions. And you could look at it and say, you know, are they just nitpicking us to death with details? But actually, these are like critical investor protection functions that, that the securities regulators in this country don't want digital assets that are securities to go, to go missing with no recourse. Uh, and so you know, the transfer agent plays that function. So I sort of identified that there was a, a need to to have this and to have a new way of doing it that's efficient and leverages the power of the blockchain. That's, that's what Block Agent is uh, trying to do. That's awesome. What are your thoughts, John? Um, so you know, there, there's, a, there's a huge schism right, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the blockchain and blockchain believers around which direction we're going to go. And, and I, you know, a couple of years ago, I was talking about uh, lit versus dark markets uh, for, for cryptocurrencies. And I always believed that the way forward was going to be what Jeff is proposing, which is a lit market for cryptocurrencies, which you'll have to acknowledge uh, and, and, and permanently identify um, uh, account uh, or, or keys to account ownership to physical human beings through traditional methods of physical identification and, and nationality identification. Um, and, uh, and, and there'll be, you know, continue to be some type of underground dark market where those uh, identities are not associated with, um, with accounts. And that will become more and more marginalized over over time, um, uh, particularly if you ever want to attract a, um, a retail market and uh, for uh, what I'll call the non uh, the core the core tokens. So say Bitcoin, Ethereum, maybe a few others, but any interest in producing uh, new types of stores of value or currencies uh, beyond those sort of native grandfathered in uh, assets uh, would have to sort of follow follow this path. And I think that's becoming more and more um, obvious to 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 most groups. Um, the, certainly from an institutional perspective, institutional investor perspective, I, I, don't, I don't see any other way institutional investors will be comfortable um, investing in this asset class without that sort of that, that function. Um, and and I, I don't know many people, serious people, who still believe that that's a path, that's, that's a path forward. Yeah. Right. And it's interesting. Like, so one of the things about start setting up a new company is you know, going to get kind of business insurance. And so kind of working with kind of people who, you know, who, who have um, experience uh, writing insurance policies for digital assets or crypto assets. And so, you know, the, like the, the scenario John described, like, like an institutional investor, you know, they take market risk. They don't take, you know, my asset disappearing risk and without, without recourse. And, you know, to promote adoption of, of these kinds of instruments by those types of, of them, you know, they need to, you know, they need to see that kind of thing. So I was explaining this to the, you know, these insurance providers, they're like, wait, wait a second. So you're saying if the asset is gone, you can just freeze it and get it back, and so there aren't losses. It's like, yeah, that's correct. So I say, okay, and so what, what, are, what loss and risk are we insuring then? Like, you know, so it sort of, it mitigates some of the risks that exist with other, you know, digital assets. I mean, there, there's still ways, you know, there's still plenty of risks, and, you know, we, we then become a target and we can get attacked. But you know, there's also like an off-chain record, and you know, they have the ability to kind of reset things to the to the way they were. Though you sort of don't want to fall back on that too, too regularly. Yeah, and, and it's clear. I mean, to know, like, the, these institutional investors are are very comfortable with losses. You know, losses occur. They're very comfortable with with, with absolute losses, with zero losses. Zero losses occur, and they're also very comfortable holding assets that can just disappear. They hold bare assets. You know, this, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you know, endowment holds timber and holds you know farmland. I mean, these things can be wiped out. Now there are insurance policies that protect. So it's not it's not that you know you hear a lot of um, I hear a lot of talk about how one of the, the things stopping the industry or stopping uh, cryptocurrencies from growing as an asset class are 
are, uh, you know, misunderstanding, uh, regulatory intervention, or, or lack of clear regulatory oversight, um, or misunderstanding on behalf of investors. I, I think that's misplaced. I, I think institutional investors understand bearer risks. They've been around, you know, it's been a while since bearer, bearer instruments were common, but they still understand it. Um, from a regulatory um, uh, perspective, I, I actually will say the opposite. I think, I think the overall regulatory landscape in the US has been extremely generous to cryptocurrencies. We've gone through over the last, say, 18 to 24 months, uh, a mark-to-market loss of close to 95% in many, many cryptocurrencies. If there were any other asset class where a 95% peak to trough occurred over a 12 to 18 month period, you would see Dodd-Frank 2.0. There'd be massive regulatory intervention, people would go to jail. The fact that almost nothing happened besides some of the low hanging fruit uh, frauds being, being taken down by the SEC, I think it's extraordinarily generous on behalf of most, of most regulators. So, so I think, I think what, you're, what you're seeing is a, a kind of, uh, there's, there's an early adoption amongst uh, individuals mostly who are very comfortable dealing um, in, in, in the dark space, if you will. Uh, and then we're, now we're seeing a gravitation to, to a lit market where, whether it's through security ICOs or, um, or what Jeff's working on, um, we're going to see if they're actually, if the efficiencies associated with blockchain innovation vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, trading of assets uh, are, are truly there. Uh, and then you'll see uh, a gradual uh, shift over for, uh, for institutional investors. Right, right. Shifting gears a little bit, why don't we talk about Libra? There's been a lot of talk and attention and sometimes hype and criticism. What are your thoughts, Jeff? And then, John, you can jump in. Yeah, so um, the Li Libra is really fascinating. And as a Scorpio, I'm naturally skeptical of Libras, but uh, yeah. it's late in the day. Gotta... <laughs> good try. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's good. Exactly. good. Yeah. Cal Calibra, I'm going to calibrate anyway. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> You know, you know I just, I've had a, a you know a, a few reactions to it, and you know, first of all, you know, the, the thing the thing got announced, and it was definitely you know very, you know, very attention getting, and um, you know, like there's lots of tech companies or companies that that announce a new product and it doesn't go anywhere. But when somebody makes an announcement and they've got you know 2.6 billion or 3 billion users or some you know number of users across all their platforms, that's very attention getting, and you know, I've spent a lot of time looking at the way regulators think about uh, crypto assets, not just in the US, but globally. And you know, they'll look at it from a perspective of, uh, of two, th you know, two main things, like one of uh, financial stability impact. And so the, uh, up until Libra, everybody said, well, you know, it's, it's really small. We're continuing to monitor it. We're trying to come up with metrics for it. You know, but you know, whether you're talking about Financial Stability Board, BIS, you know, all sorts of different national and international groups, they're like, well, it's, it's still small any way you measure it. So Libra kind of changes that. And then you know, the, the other way they look at it, uh, these, some of these other crypto assets is as a, a payment system. And they say, well, you know, none of them have really been that effective, and none of them are as good as cash. So all of a sudden, you have uh, Li Libra, which has, well, kind of what it is exactly, you know, is it is it an ETF? Is it a, is it a derivative? Is it a commodity pool? Is it a money market fund? Because the idea is there's going to be this, this coin, and then it's backed by you know, cash and bonds that's held somewhere. It's going to be kind of managed by this group. You know, so there's a lot of diff different. Um, it's like a hedge fund. Right. It's how, yeah, it's, it could be a, a, hedge, a hedge. You know, there's, there's a lot of things it could be. And it could be different things in different, diff different countries. So, but you know, certainly from, from the time it was announced, it, it, it got the regulators' uh, attention. And it was really different from anything else that had happened just by its scale um, and they're in crypto assets. Um, you know, to me, uh, you know, some of my initial reactions were like, you know, just kind of what exactly is it? Um, they, they seemed to say they, they had, uh, based on their kind of initial, um, and I was teaching a course this summer, so I just kind of plugged this in. There's like great discussion with the students about it. Um, the the um, you know the uh, their person their public policy person sort of went and sort of uh, went and testified in front of the House and the Senate and had a statement that sort of summarized everything and it was you know so you know he got beaten up by 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 everybody but at least it was a concise statement but you know some things seemed to me like they didn't make sense like they they proposed to be regulated in Switzerland by Finma which is their kind of market regulator, which is if you sort of combine the SEC and the CFTC, you know, that's kind of what FINMA does. And they've been one of the most, uh, you know, very forward-looking regulators in terms of, you know, the crypto valley of Zug was that, you know, they were sort of early, they sort of, 
They've got lines that divide utility tokens, payment tokens, security tokens. The category of things that are not securities is broader, generally speaking, in Switzerland than it is here. But I just thought, you know, this thing is, you know, they, they seem to be regulator shopping. And also, even if they go to Switzerland, shouldn't this thing be regulated by the central bank? And I, you know, just one other reaction I'll, I'll add to this, which is that you know, I was at a conference uh, you know, in, in September of you know, international financial regulators in, in Helsinki. And the French finance minister chose that, you know, chose that kind of platform to announce that France is dead set against this. That he's saying that, that this is you know, payments and monetary policy is, is the province of, uh, of governments. And then Germany promptly agreed with them. And you know, you, you're seeing a lot of you know, just countries paying attention to this and opposing this. So to me, you know, maybe it, it'll evolve in some other form, but I have a hard time believing that they can you know, launch this thing in the gauntlet of so much opposition. Yeah, I think, I think, um, I think Mark Zuckerberg had Elon Musk envy. Um, and what I mean by that is I read, I read, a, I read a report, I read a report that, that they, had lit, they had done polling around like tech luminaries and Mark Zuckerberg was kind of ranked there with Bill Gates and he, he, he was angry at that because he's this boring old guy. And so I think he said, I'm going to take a page from Elon Musk. I'm going to get up, I'm going to say something that will probably happen in some form in like 50 years and I'm going to say it's going to happen next week and everyone's going to go crazy and it's going to be amazing. And, and so when I, when I first read the paper, when it came out, I, I just, again, I was like, this is, this is no way this is going to happen anywhere close to the time frame it's, that he says it is. Um, but, you know, again, 25, 50, my, my six-year-old daughter sitting there and like, you know, in the world when she's my age, there's a very, very good chance there'll be a, not only digital store of value, but more efficient digital payment mechanisms. Um, and so, uh, you know, that was the first, my first reaction was this is, this is a, you know, and say what you will about Elon Musk, I think because of his hyperbole, we're probably further along towards the adoption of electric cars that we would have been without him. So the hyperbole has, I think, some, some value if, if you're not, if you haven't been long the stock. Um, and so, and so uh, um, that was my first reaction. The second reaction was uh, similar to Jeff's, which is when you kind of look into what they're trying to accomplish, there's a very, very high probability this would get shut down almost immediately in that pure form. So I said, well, these are very, very smart people. What, they're not going to waste all this time and money. So what are they actually trying to do? And you know, for me, it was clear it's, it's Calibra. It's the, wallet, it's the wallet function. So if you can start to train um, you know, even one-tenth of their user base to accepting and using an on-phone you know, on wallet, uh, and that becomes the wallet standard, uh, then you can start to push you know, even, again, even non-currency type instruments then. You can start trading farm bill tokens or new exchange, new, new, new game tokens, create fungibility around these these assets that the regulators probably won't care as much about, and you begin to get you know, really, really interesting data on people's purchasing patterns, which is probably the only thing Facebook doesn't have really, really good data on uh, you know, compared to, say, an Amazon. Um, and so it uh, makes all the sense in the world. Uh, we will probably do it, even though we'll hand ring and say, oh, we can't let Facebook have all this. We, we probably will do it anyway, because it'll be super convenient and easy um, and cheap. <laughs> uh, and so you know, we'll you know, fast forward you know, five to 10 years, and um, whether or not they're successful in, in having this be some type of currency or, or store of value or surrogate for, uh, for the US dollar, uh, we probably will have been giving, we will, give, we will collectively give Facebook a, a tremendous amount of more interesting data than they currently have on how we like to think about value. Um, and so that's the play. Um, if the net, again, if the net benefit longer term is that we get more comfortable using, using these wallets and that leads to a more efficient um, uh, monetary system, that's, I guess that's good. Um, uh, but in the meantime, we'll be trained to provide you know, more and better uh, identifying information to the monolith. Then, um, and there's no way to stop it. No matter what you, you sit there going, oh, I won't do it. No, you will. You will all do it. I'll do it. Uh, I have like nine Alexas in my house. Uh, I've given them myself up to the Borg. Uh, we absolutely will. Um, the question is going to be, you know, what's the what's the RO the ROD I call it, the return on data. So will Facebook be smart enough to figure out a way either through uh, economic terms or through little you know little things that come to our phone that make us happy and release endorphins in our brain? Uh, will they give us return for this incremental data they're asking for us? Um, that's going to be the question, and they're so really good at figuring that out. They probably here? will. Yeah. Yeah. Can I touch? Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. please, please. Yeah. So I, I think John's the point is real, but you know, right? That, that what they're what they're trying to achieve, right? Is 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 not is not just, that, but it, you know, it, it is to have this thing that's commonly used for economic purposes, and maybe there will be some economics, or maybe there will be data, maybe it'll be all of the above. But you know, if you look at other social media platforms in in Asia, like WeChat or, or 
you know, Alipay, Tencent, like with those, that you know, the consumer behavior is completely different. People are using you know these these communications apps on their phones, you know, not just to send each other payments, but they uh, buy financial products, they buy insurance products. Um, you know, they're used for these, and so you know, F Facebook can look at that and say, how are we going to catch up with with what they're doing? And so this is a potential way to um, you know accelerate it and. Uh, you know, just one other observation I would make, and then it looks like we have a question up top, but, you know, is that, you know, Facebook banned cryptocurrency advertising for like a year to a year and a half. Yeah. And, you know, it was like, it seemed like they were being kind of responsible during the ICO boom and like, okay, we're just being cautious. And so, you know, but then it turns out that they've secretly been de developing their own cryptocurrency for a year, and then maybe two weeks before they announce Libra, they end the ban on cryptocurrency advertising. So, you know, I think that, you know, that kind of market power and behavior is the kind of thing that should also be looked into. Right. Do you say we had a question from someone? Just yeah, my lab. Just to follow up on that. Um, so you say it, like most of these regulators, especially from Europe or here, the, the first instinct is to say no. But we know that certain markets are going to embrace it, like Switzerland, or some emerging markets where they don't have a lot to lose. They'll be more open to adopting the technology that is so what advice would you give regulators in the US or in Europe where they're kind of stalling innovation or kind of preventing something that's a rolling snowball? What should you tell them to do? Like how would you tell them to so, so I find the two, the two least compelling arguments for, um, for cryptocurrency are one, um, you should buy some because if only 1% of the world owns it, it's going to go up in value. I don't know if anybody's here from Yale Endowment, but that, that's a horrible way to invest. You know, institutional investors don't, first of all, that, that works for any company in the world. You should invest in my company because if only 1% of the human beings buy my product, it'll be really successful. Well. That's nonsense. And, and secondly, institutional investors, that's not how they invest. They don't go buy lottery tickets on lots and lots of things. Um, the second most non-compelling argument for cryptocurrency is, um, in my view, is, is you know, if, if, it's fear mongering. So if you don't, if, in the US, if you don't allow it, uh, Malta will or Guernsey will. I, I don't think anyone in, in, in Washington is scared of um, illicit behavior being pushed out to Malta. So, so I, I don't see the snowball that, that you see. I see, um, and I don't see, Again, I, I don't see regulation in the U.S. as the primary reason innovation isn't growing. First of all, innovation in blockchain is not regulated. It's not closed off in any way. So, so there's no reason, there's no regulatory reason why blockchain companies can't work successfully here in the U.S. The, the thing that's being slowed is, um, I think reasonably, uh, is retail audiences being sold through rampant speculative means, uh, digital assets that have um, you know, almost no fundamental value. Um, and I think there's, there's you know, we, for virtually every country has this concept of accredited versus non-accredited investors. Um, so that, to me, is the only thing that's being slowed down. Blockchain innovation, I, I, I have a hard time understanding how U.S. regulatory constructs slow true blockchain uh, uh, innovation. Ripple being a great example. They're doing incredibly well uh, on the blockchain side of their business. Um, and even XRP is, is allowed to freely trade. So, so I, 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 I don't know if that's going to be a compelling argument for US regulators, um, because I think the thing they believe they're stopping is the bad part of that innovation, not the good part. But, but please, I'd love to hear no, your response. Uh, I'm yeah. more interested in. So Facebook has such a large market share and power, mm -hmm. like they own all this data and all these people and all these users. Mm -hmm. My question is more towards Libra, more than any other. Just Libra, okay. Just Libra. Yeah, um, and, and, and your question is more like what strategy would they? Yeah, like, uh, yes. If we don't, if we don't let it happen here in France, is that hurt us because other countries will, will start using Libra and there'll be some benefits. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but there'll be benefits that we won't accrue to, won't accrue to us. Yeah, well, I, th you know, I think is that, is that right? Is that? Yeah, something in those lines, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, there, there's, there's a, f a few way. I mean, you know, they sort of, they might have had their own idea of what the enga regulatory engagement process would be, but now the regulators will tell them you know, what the regulatory engagement process will be. So I think they'll have to, and you know, that's being done. I mean, groups are being convened at, at the G7, you know, just uh, a couple weeks ago that are, you know, to, to study this and, and assess the things. So, but I mean, just imagine that, like if any other company just said, hey, I'm gonna start a new product in a year. And then, you know, a month later, the G7 convenes, to, you know. So, <laughs> you know, they're, they're very alarmed. So they're, they're not gonna be able to just kind of Uber their way, their way through it. 
Um, but you know, I think that, like to the point John was making before, you know, the the you know the, the important thing may be kind of the data, and the important thing may be the wallet. And so it may be that there are concessions that they can make, you know, in in the structure that will address concerns that the regulators have. Some of it could be through kind of reporting and greater transparency. Some of it could be, you know, who is, you know, who is the right regulator. Maybe they need to be needs to be overseen by, you know, a college of of regulators uh, that sort of do it collectively with one as the lead. So, for example, the CLS payment system is is regulated, is regulated that way. Um, you know, yeah. it, it'll yeah. to play out. There's yeah. the one thing I saw. You know, literally, I was reading on on the train ten minutes before I got here. Is that now? It says that Visa and Mastercard may kind of pull out because they're worried about the the repercussions, and so you know, kind of just who the group is that's part of it may also get reformulated, you know, because you know people are feeling all kinds of, of pressures. So the, the thing I say is a big a big part of the white paper uh, is around uh, the unbanked. So a big focus of Libra is, is is pushing this out to the unbanked, and 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 that's that's wonderful, and that that should be something that that we collectively as a society should 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 push. But my my concern with any whenever I hear any of these. Uh, plans to reach the unbanked is um, it's getting easier and easier to reach the unbanked because mobile technology is getting cheaper and cheaper and you can just airdrop you know very very cheap phones into people's hands who couldn't afford them before and so so reaching them is getting easier uh, I had a chart that I show um, uh, in terms of like you know 10 frontier markets in Africa how the cost of acquiring these customers because the uh, the uh, per, the um, accessibility of, of, of cheap phones is getting uh, more and more pervasive so getting to these individuals is is one thing uh, it's easier. So my concern is if you if you're getting if you're on if you're onboarding them into a financial system that hasn't been built to think about their needs. If you're just in you're you're t you're, you're bringing someone on who has no credit history and you're subjecting them to a, a credit uh, schema uh, that is not designed for them, um, is that the best thing? Um, and we've seen, you know, through um, through microfinance, we've seen some horrible stories of uh, of excessive debt being built up on uh, individuals in very very poor countries, uh, who were who who because they were we were onboarding them into a traditional credit model that um, uh, maybe wasn't the best for them, and so and so uh, getting people on platform, getting the unbanked on platform is a wonderful endeavor if you truly have their best interests at heart. And my concern is by plugging them into a credit system that wasn't really designed for them, uh, that's, that's not exactly in their, in their best interests. So um, that makes me a little bit, a little bit nervous, uh, given that the ability of Facebook to go out and, and, and they truly can onboard, onboard these individuals. But what are we onboarding them into? Uh, I know we created credit systems and uh, uh, other types of systems that is truly in their best interest. I want to take your question up further. Uh, you, if you know, uh, <clears throat> like the uh, from the third world nation, the less developed nation, you onboarding the prospective customers. But mm -hmm. Facebook's uh, and that is an adverse selection. You have less information about the, it's an information asymmetry. So you have less information about that customer. But Facebook already has a lot of information about you. I mean, mm -hmm. they can do a much better job in a credit risk. So why not allow Libra? Well, that's the theory, right? There's lots of companies that claim that they can improve on FICO tremendously through uh, social media data. I actually don't know how that's panned out. I don't think it's I don't think it's that much worse, but I don't think it's that much better. Um, I actually think the old 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 school model credit scoring systems, in terms of estimating default probability, are holding up pretty well. Um, there's lots of folks who believe they can do this better if they get all of this data about people. And, and I know there's some fascinating work going on in predictive analytics. Um, and so in theory, it makes sense. But I actually think most of the attempts currently, I think Lending Club and Prosper and all these companies that claim they can dramatically improve credit scoring, um, I don't think that's worked out as well as, as everybody said. It's marginally better, but it's not dramatically better. Um, and then, sorry, please. No, I was just going to add, well, one of the questions also about the structure um, is like who actually is going to have the um, you know, AML obligation? You know, who's going to have to know the customer? And is it at the Libra level? Is it going to be at, at the wallet level? Um, you know, there's also going to be this kind of this, this Libra governing body and, and other things like that. And so you know, if, if Calibra is really the, the thing that's going to be proprietary to Facebook, you know the the uh, you know the suggestion at least initially and and I think one of the Congress people or senators drilled down on this, 
you know, they seem to be saying, well, the 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 KYC is going to have to be is going to be done at the wallet level, not at the not at the token level, right? Now that creates you know some potential for mischief, right? If uh, so, maybe does it need to be at at the wallet level? Does it need to be at the token level? Does it need to be at both? How is this all going to work? And you know, is is that going to be too much too much friction? Um, and you know, so, so Facebook wants to have a proprietary wallet, so you sort of say, well, that, that must be a big part of what's in it for them, and then having the wallet, and then having the, the, the data. But you know, it's a question, you know, who is going to have that responsibility? Are they going to be able to execute it? Are they going to be able to you know, perform in accordance with international standards? And actually, you know, there's a you know, pretty significant degree of international convergence through Financial Action Task Force, they put it, did a whole bunch of new kind of guidance and interpretations that uh, was was confirmed in uh, June, and it still has to be implemented at a kind of national level. But there, there's there's very strong international uh, consensus around a lot of these principles, including that when there are transfers in excess of, I think it's a thousand dollars or a thousand euros, which is a pretty low level. Um, then you need to have destination and you know, be beneficiary information. So who's, how is that going to be performed with Libra? Um, is that going to be at the wallet? Is it going to be at the token? Is it going to be at both? I think these are just some of the questions that will need to be answered. There's another question here. <clears throat> so you keep on talking about a credit system, but it's not necessarily clear that Libra is going to act as a credit-based system. It can just be, I have so many of Libra and move it along. Um, I don't, and I don't even know if it would be beneficial for Libra to try and create a credit-based system internally, as opposed to having a third-party company say, okay, I'm going to let you leverage however many Libra for, you know, as collateral for, or, you know, whatever, some real asset as collateral and then give you um, some more Libra to play around with. So I don't, I would argue that you kind of spend a lot of time talking about credit, but I don't know if that's really part of it um, or if it needs to be. And then I, I would also kind of throw in the, um, you know, on the KYC AML problem, I know I've mentioned this before, but um, banking the unbanked and KYC AML checks tend to be in very strong tension with each other. Um, and I kind of wonder if, you know, at the end of this, the, the, the game plan isn't just to say, okay, okay, we're going to get rid of this whole, like, currency thing. We're just going to have, like, you know, the Facebook, you know, credit the way I can go, you know, in Fortnite, you know, go buy your skins or whatever and, you know, trade these tokens around that, you know, obviously do have real-world value because I can go and buy some. Uh, but no one's trying to regulate that through a KYC ML process. And if you have a artificial, you know, loyalty point system effectively that stays within the Facebook model, that's actually something that could be incredibly useful for the unbanked to for barter and trade, but isn't actually linked to the real world currency. And so, I mean, I'm I'm curious if I'm, I'm I kind of have a I'm speculating that I think that might be where this is trying to go. So anyway, those are my two random thoughts. Feel free to <laughs> respond or ignore them. Yeah, I don't know if, if Facebook wants to become a lender. Uh, I do think, though, once they've got um, once they've got that captive audience, they're going to open up their platform and allow uh, individuals to access those unbanked. And one of the ways you make money uh, is through credit. So I think it's high, I mean, just you know, it's highly unlikely to me that uh, if they're successful, you won't. And they open up their API the way they did their social graph. Uh, and we, you know, the net result of that was Cambridge Analytica. Um, I think it's highly unlikely uh, that we won't, you won't see predatory agencies looking to take advantage of those of those that have been onboarded. Um, uh, you know, I, I note I note that most of the robo advisory firms that started saying we will never sell uh, complex products are now selling complex products because guess what you can't make money off of one thousand dollar accounts where you charge one one basis point uh, a quarter on it. So, so I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you that you know, Facebook becoming a bank would be a pretty huge shift. Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. Um, I'm, more, I'm just more concerned about what happens when, um, uh, when they do onboard these individuals, and then they're, um, will, will, can we count on Facebook to be judicious about who they allow access to these individuals? Um, again, I would encourage you to look at what happened with microfinance uh, in certain parts of India, um, and what happened when um, you allow predatory agencies to uh, access um, individuals who have never uh, been around credit or been, 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 been comfortable with credit. Um, you end up with some pretty horrific scenarios um, of, of you know, literal immolation of individuals lighting themselves on fire because they couldn't handle the embarrassment of, of, of concepts of bankruptcy where it doesn't exist in certain areas. So, so I'm just, I just don't know if I, I, if I trust Facebook to be a good arbiter of who should have access to those individuals. 
I think the, the no, please. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we have one minute. Yeah. yeah. So how do you guys see, and I have my own opinion coming from the data center space and working in different parts of Africa uh, with um, the telcos, how do you guys see Libra comparing to the m -Pace of Vodafone and eWallet, MTN um, uh, comparison? How do, you, how do you guys see the telcos um, compared to the Facebooks and the, and for me, the Libra is the cryptocurrency um, negative effect on the market as a, in comparison to M-Pesa and E-Wallet is giving the unbanked opportunity and, but the telcos are really becoming the banks or the um, allocators of uh, the finance or the opportunity there. So how do you guys compare Libra versus the e-wallet and M-Pesa, if you guys are familiar with those mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 asset or not assets, but um, uh, uh, technology that's utilized for finance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, the potential is, is definitely there. And, you know, you had these people who sort of jumped right to kind of mobile and mobile finance and, you know, there were no landlines and actually that, you know, brought a lot of benefit to a lot of people, and it just sort of, you know, leapfrogged the the sequence of technology phases that you know, kind of in the U.S. or Western Europe, that they went through. So you know, whether whether, you know, I, I think that you know, as kind of regulators and policymakers have you know started studying kind of crypto assets really over the last five or six years, kind of the the, the potential to do that, you know, is something that's been you know on on the radar screen. The opportunity for financial inclusion. Uh, the the unbanked um, and uh, you know the technology as an enabler. Um, so you know I I think that there's you know a, a very good chance that it will be the technology companies that are doing this, particularly you know in, in, in kind of in certain countries you know like here it's it's anathema for most. This is a bit of a generalization, but you know it's anathema like. Technology companies want to be technology companies. They don't want to be regulated financial services company. It's just a different culture. It's a different DNA. That's kind of part of what it is. But you know, in in, in countries where there's kind of like different structures, or you know, you, the least little thing doesn't bring you under the Bank Holding Company Act or something. I think there's a little more freedom to act. You know, there is going to be you know where people's money is concerned. There's always, and particularly retail individuals, there's always going to be I think a heightened Degree of regulatory scrutiny, and you know, to protect kind of vulnerable uh, investors. But you know, I think what what we're seeing, and 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 Libra, you know, for all its you know pros and cons, has really been a catalyst of, of much greater engagement. You know, these are the types of tools that can accomplish it. Yeah, I mean, look, if there was a, if there was a telco with three billion users, I think they'd be better positioned than Facebook to do this. But there <laughs> isn't. So there's Facebook. So um, you know, the telcos have to worry about you know pesky banking laws and things that Facebook apparently doesn't feel that they have to worry about. So they can just launch this without any of that. So I mean, the, 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 the telcos are the I mean, and Pace is an unbelievable success story. Like you know, the, the 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 rampant critics of cryptocurrency and blockchain. So Nuriel Rabini is a really good friend, and I'm a little bit to the left of him. But but he'll if he were here, and I can't do his accent, but he would say far more eloquently than me, um, that's where you should look to to innovation in personal finance and, and, and onboarding the unbanked, because that's been the real true true innovation. Um, and this is sort of a poor man's attempt, Libra's a poor man's attempt to replicate on a larger scale what the telcos are currently doing and doing very, very successfully. Awesome. Well, I'm going to say we were going to have this panel with Jeff and Donna Riddell, and she unfortunately fell ill and couldn't come. And we also were going to have someone, a quick business case with someone from Securitize uh, who had a last minute issue as well. So right now we're going to take another break, network and talk and meet whoever you want. And then we're going to end with a final keynote with Sandra. So yeah.
Hey, we're back. We're going to have our final keynote now with Sandra Rowe. She recently got named one of the board members of GDF, Global Digital Finance, which is what Jeff started. It's a small world. And she has done work with Bitcoin futures and um, is involved with the EU Observatory and Forum and with the NYS Digital Currency Task Force. Mostly she travels all over the world, most recently the Vatican, which is super exciting, uh, to talk about uh, digital currency issues in light of regulation. So, yeah. Great. So, first of all, thank you guys for watching this late. Um, so I appreciate that and hope that you will get a few nuggets of things that you didn't know before. So um, why have I titled it such a long title? Um, how tech is colliding with government, law, money, and societal organization. We are seeing much more than just about, and I know we spend most of our day today talking about cryptocurrencies, but I will actually take a step back and say, let's look at the macro of what's going on um, and trends around the world. And I do have the fortune, as um, Diana mentioned, of going to lots of different countries and speaking to lots of different leaders, regulators, central bankers, entrepreneurs, and getting a very different perspective on sort of what's going on relative to the US. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the major trends. And um, if it wasn't clear before, I'm uh, wearing my hat as the Oh, is that better? Yes, now you can hear me. OK. So I wear a couple different hats in the space. Um, I'm a former banker turned market infrastructure executive um, who launched the Bitcoin Futures at CME Group. And then I actually focus now on social impact. Um, and I spend all my time in blockchain. I look at and emerging, mar emerging tech. So I look at things like, what can the tech do to solve real world problems? And I focus on things like um, helping those who are um, obviously left out in the digital divide, and also how can we as a community scale things. So these are things that are of interest to me. And when I think about digital assets in blockchain, and I've been in this space for about eight years now, it's very clear. It's growing opportunity sets around the world. It is lumpy, bumpy, and messy, but we are seeing massive adoption in categories I never even dreamed of before. Five years ago, if you had asked me, I'd be talking to certain industry groups, I would have just laughed and been like, no way. But we are. So worlds are colliding. And what Ken said earlier about trust and erosion of trust of institutions is absolutely correct. And I think the reason why we're having this collision now at this point in time is because we have certain technologies that have sort of grown up and are pervasive. And then on top of that, we have this trust deficit. And we have people all over the world who are going through some pretty big shifts in culture, uh, what are institutions, um, you know, how do we look at money? And so these are the things that are driving a lot of, I think, the sort of collision that's going on. And we're going to continue to see this for decades. I don't think this is a next year, next two years. I, Bitcoin's been around for over, well, almost 11 years now. It's not new. But what it has done is actually spawned a whole nother level of innovation. So blockchain and digital assets are both new and old, I would argue, because we're seeing waves of innovation. So when I think about developing world adoption, adaption, it's very different than um, what ha is happening in the US or in Europe. When I think about going mainstream, absolutely. There are certain industries where blockchain is now being incorporated. And then the arguments before about, oh, no, it can only be a private blockchain, can't be a public blockchain. Those are being dismissed as well as we speak. So things are evolving. And then you've got the government regulatory engagement. A lot of time was spent on that, so I may just sort of gloss over that. But I want to talk about megatrends, because that also is a reason for why some of these collisions are happening. When you talk about demographic changes, we are going to see some unprecedented levels of demographic change. Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa alone will put another billion people on this planet over the next two decades. The average age, depending on the country you're talking about, will be between 14 and 19 years old. The US, you can look this up, is about 38. Japan, add another decade to that. And Germany as well, something like that. They're in their 40s. Um, what does that mean? It means our growth engine of tomorrow, the people who need to solve our problems of tomorrow, are actually sitting in different parts of the world. And if they don't get the education and the opportunity set, we're going to see things that we have not seen before. We think the migration issues are bad now with refugees. Uh, just wait another couple decades if we don't 
deal with this head on. Another issue, environmental and climate change, I think everyone's well aware. Um, there's lots of discussion around what to do, but we need to start doing, right? So this is another problem. And government and conflicts, um, which happen and are growing. So the smartphone. I spend my time in certain countries where I would have thought, hmm, if you don't have running water and you don't have basic electricity, they can't have a smartphone, can't have a phone, but they do. I think it's a really sad statistic, but it is true. If you go to most countries, most people will have some form of a phone, whether it's a dumb phone or a smartphone, that evolution is actually um, advancing quite rapidly to where a lot of people now have smartphones. Here's the issue. As a society, what does that say about us when we've got more people with phones than running water or electricity or a home? Just something to think about. But the good news is we can actually reach people that we couldn't reach before. The bad news is your phone is now your single major security risk. I have been SIM swapped. If you guys don't know what that means, Google it. A lot of people in the crypto space have been SIM swapped, and it's a massive problem um, for those in this community. But I guarantee to you what is a problem in the crypto community right now is going to evolve to mu much bigger mainstream problems of identity when your phone number is a source of vulnerability. Think about how many times you give out your phone number. OK, and trust is the foundation. So I talked a little bit about, and this was already mentioned before, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica data scandal. This is only going to get worse if we do not have mechanisms for how we treat data. And right now, I go to conferences all the time. We debate this again and again and again. There is no global group who is really managing how we're going to have data privacy. Um, done. People are doing it at the local level. Every country is coming up with their own. Um, the EU obviously has been the most advanced with the GDPR um, laws coming into play. California has put their own in, but it's a patchwork. TBD. Developing world adoption adaption. So I'm going to take a little tour with you today, very quickly, around the world. Um, places you probably didn't think blockchain was happening. So in Rwanda, we supported, and I, when I say we, I mean GBVC, which is a Swiss nonprofit focusing on education and building partnership and advocacy. Um, we sponsored the first and co-sponsored with the youth ministry of uh, the government in Rwanda, the first youth hackathon focusing on green economy. And they had 100 youths, typical hackathon, where they were coding and using different blockchain solutions to come up with um, solving some of uh, the green economy um, problem sets, and a lot of it's around soil erosion, around agriculture, and also climate change. So that was pretty cool. That's just the beginning. In Rwanda, you have a population of 3 million people, again, very young, who are just so, the buckets of energy and desire, you know what they're missing? Investment, dollars, and support, and education, brain, brain trust. So we gotta figure out how to close that gap. Um, Kazakhstan, I was just there in June, meeting with um, various government officials. The AIFC, for those of you who are not familiar, is actually an economic zone that was launched officially last year, July 2017, uh, 18. It's um, relatively new. And one of the things that they've done is really cool. They have English law. They have English language inside of Astana, which, by the way, they changed the name of this city. It's now called Nur Sultan, after the former president. The interesting thing about the AIFC is it's attracting a whole load of blockchain companies. Why? Why would a region in the middle of Kazakhstan be attracting so many uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain companies? Well, here's the thing. Uh, one Belt, One Road, pretty significant role Kazakhstan's playing. And when a lot of these companies, whether they come from uh, UAE, or Amsterdam, or Switzerland, or Japan, they're looking at Kazakhstan as the central point of where they're going to have their Central Asian outposts. So this hub is actually attracting quite a few blockchain and crypto companies from abroad. I was really shocked by how many different countries were represented. And it's just starting. I think it has to do, actually, with the move that they made, which was English law, English language, and on top of that, um, they have allowed for cryptocurrencies within that specific zone. 
not in the country as a whole. But One Belt, One Road, again, significant from a uh, trade perspective. And then you've got the AIFC, who is now attracting fintech startups. Venezuela. This, to me, is a uh, country I'm looking at because I think it also tells you where cryptocurrency and digital assets can be used for bad. Um, I think we have to wait and see whether this becomes a test case or a use case where a country could start all over and build a digital-based society that could actually instill trust. They have that opportunity set if a new regime were to come in and want to implement that. But the reality is right now as we speak of what's going on with this PetroCoin, um, you know, it's again government using uh, technology for not so good. Going mainstream. These are the industry sectors that I find quite interesting and actually very impactful, because obviously each one of us is impacted by each of these categories. Uh, when I think about where the energy sector is, um, they're looking at a lot of this P2P tradable stuff, and they're also looking at efficiencies. I just spent some time with the Abu Dhabi um, National Oil Company about corporation about efficiencies that they're doing on the blockchain. And this is purely for their own internal subsidiaries on improving their supply chain. That's what they're looking at. Um, but you've got a lot of other guys who are looking at P2P uh, exchange um, trading. So when you look at financial services, I would say that's the granddaddy of all the industries. Um, it is the most regulated, most likely, but it is the most advanced. So when you hear about Santander um, you know, settling a bond on the public Ethereum blockchain, $30 million worth, announced last week, that's a major milestone. I don't think people really understood how big of a deal that is. It's the public blockchain. Um, you talked to banks five years ago, they would have told you to just leave if you had mentioned a public blockchain. It's, it's actually a sea change. Um, JP Morgan, by the way, has over 200 banks inside of its uh, IIN. You'll have to look up what exactly it stands for. I think it's the Interbank Information Network. It's their JP Morgan coin, and it's used purely for interbank settlement. They've got over 200 banks in that network now. If anyone asked you that blockchain is not happening, it's happening. It's just probably not being readily discussed as the price of Bitcoin. Um, food, this is where I find some of the most innovative and interesting stuff is how can we track and improve food safety. If you are able to pinpoint where some uh, salmonella breakout happens much faster and quicker, you can't prevent the breakout, but you can prevent all of an industry's produce going and being thrown out and you can actually save lives potentially by identifying it faster. And to me, these are the kind of advances that make um, blockchain the most exciting thing. And when you think about healthcare um, and land and real estate, we're just at the beginning of seeing advances. And I will tell you right now, make a prediction for 2020, I'm seeing massive ramping up in the healthcare sector. I think we're gonna see some pretty amazing use cases. But I'm gonna give you another one, just to give you an example. And by the way, the slides will be all available for you. I've listed out all of what I'm seeing in the aviation industry and dividing into categories. And these are the use cases when you think about what is happening in the aviation industry. And I will tell you, it is fascinating. It is everything from aircraft lease financing, it's data sharing and analytics to improving flight safety, uh, as well as tokenization of loyalty points and identity management. It's pretty cool stuff, and there's a lot there. So I'm gonna talk about one in particular that got announced in June. Identity management, known traveler digital identity. If you've noticed your airports have gotten a little bit more automated lately about going in and out, some of them have, some of them haven't. This one's actually really innovative. So you, let's say you go through Amsterdam, Schiphol Airport, and you're taking KLM. The airport already knows who you are because you bought the ticket probably, hopefully, a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago. What if you didn't have to show your identity again and again and again once you got into the airport? What if you just had a QR code that was unique to you and you used that? And obviously there would be some biometrics involved, but the combination of all of those things would allow for the uniqueness of you to be identified once you walk into the airport. You would not show, you would not get a piece of paper that has your gate on it. You would not have to show additional identification. You literally would walk through, and if you happen to be over 21 and you wanted to buy some alcohol, you would be able to just flash your QR code and it would know that you are over 21. Not that you are 36 or 42, it would know that you are over 21. 
And again, it brings up the question around how much information do we willingly give up again and again and again? And can we minimize that footprint? Then once you get on the other side, let's say you go to Toronto and you arrive. Well, here's the thing. With GDPR, you would then have the right with this particular um, uh, opportunity set here that they've got, you would actually be able to delete that entire trail. You, you person, your own person would be able to delete it. Or if you wanted to keep it, you would know that someone's storing it for you. And that power is not possible today. And under GDPR, the Dutch government is absolutely working on that. And by the way, the next step in this is not just people. If you can get this right, and I talked to the Dutch customs um, group about this that they were getting very excited about, it would pertain to actual uh, things, boxes, containers, cargo. Uh, the list goes on and on. So this is just the first step for them. OK, I'm going to go through this very quickly because I was in Ecuador, by the way, um, a couple weeks ago. Did you guys hear about the massive data leak in Ecuador? I was in Quito giving a talk about cybersecurity, and that morning, they announced that they had the largest breach in their entire country's history. Their 16 million plus people identity had been leaked. Not only that, if you had a bank account at this one particular bank, your credit rating, your bank balance, and everything else financial was revealed to the world uh, for a short while. And this was partly due to the fact that they had trusted a third party, some random startup, don't ask me why or how, I don't know, but uh, that third party had all of the identities of every Ecuadorian citizen. So by the way, if you got that data, you can now construct the family tree of all Ecuadorian families because the children's identities were um, identif uh, released. It's just shocking. And yet people just gloss over it because guess what? It happens all the time. And I know this was mentioned a lot, um, behind the scenes, we are doing actually quite a bit of work with the team on this side. Um, I think you should be aware that sometimes what's in the headlines is not actually what's happening behind the scenes. All I can say is, is that um, I think there are certain groups and governments and entities that are looking at this and the mission that they have purported to um, look to solve or look to um, mitigate and have how shall I put it? I'm trying to pay the, say this correctly. Um, open minds. And I think um, with that, you may see adoption in places where um, it's most needed. And when you think about someone who needs to move $2, how do you move $2 equivalent in a frictionless way? How do you? Because most banks don't care. So let's see how that goes. And um, as Dana mentioned, I just got back from the Vatican. And um, you might think, the Catholic Church and technology, what? So here's the thing. We spent three days together. We had technologists from Silicon Valley. We had people from all over. And it, was more, it wasn't just about blockchain. It was about AI. It was about data. It was about privacy. It was about identity. But here's the other thing. It was about what is common good, what is human dignity, and what happens to people in a world where we go so digital? Do we not have to think about the common good? And as technologists or builders or business people, do we not need to think about what we're doing as a society? And it's not about moralizing. It's not about um, you know, saying we have to do it a certain way, but it's having the consciousness that Maybe technology is not so neutral as the technologists purport it to be. When you're building algorithms that are implicitly biased, when you're taking data sets that only come from one demographic, you have built into the architecture of a technology bias. So I think the argument, and we've grappled with this a lot during the uh, three days, maybe technology is not so neutral after all especially when you're embedding those biases into the architecture of a given technology. So maybe we need to think about that. So the fact that we are um, even having these conversations with the Vatican, and think about the soft power that they have. Um, we could actually work with them to scale at a level that personally blows my mind still. 
um, because of their reach. And their reach is often in places that need help the most. I don't think there are any silver bullet answers, and I'm certainly not gonna sit here and be like, oh yes, blockchain's going to help all those you know, with financial inclusion. I don't think that answer is that easy. But I think we do need to collaborate. I think we do need to build bridges. I don't think it's about just the technologists and just the business people or just the church. It's about the collaboration piece. And for the first time, at least in my history, uh, you know, experience, I'm seeing more collaboration than ever globally, and I think we should really take hold of that. And just so you know, as a follow on to this, um, there's a re outreach to the Muslim community. There's gonna be outreach to other religious groups about how um, we can think about the common good and where technologies will play a role. So this is just the beginning. And FYI, I was also told this conference took three years to get together. It was a big deal. So I was um, very appreciative of being able to be a part of that. So as te technologists or business people, I will have to say, um, we need to think about a better society and what real problems we're solving. And we need to make sure that we keep a human-centric approach to what we do. Because otherwise, what's the point? And I thank you for that and the opportunity to speak. Thank you. And Diana, thank you. I to say, I think we had an amazing conversation from like a technologist, an economist, and a markets guy. We talked about Libra. We're talking about a global perspective. Um, and if you have any key takeaways right now, feel free to share them if anyone has an interesting takeaway that they're going to think about. Yeah, go ahead. I, I think the presentation. Uh, I think the presentation by Sandra was excellent. It also made us aware that outside the US, they're doing more social good with blockchain than what we are doing in, out here. Precisely. I, I think so too. I hate to say that. But. Yeah. What do you think you would do about that? I, I'm relatively new to blockchain. I'm coming in from the world of air, but I do have an application in, um, in healthcare, uh, and that's to use social determinants of health and that expands the outreach of healthcare, going more upstream. And we need more unifying architectures, and I think blockchain does provide that. Yeah. Interesting. Anyone else would like to share before we head off? Well, thank you, everyone, once again. Thank you. This, again. Um, this is going to be the first of a series of discussions like this, so any feedback or ideas are more than welcome.